we'll get started and sorry. Okay. How about now? How speakers are on? Okay, great. Um, Clerk, I think you're up. So I guess rather than swear both of you in at the same time, since it's sort of different uh, 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 media here, I'll uh, swear you didn't get it. All right, I, I am not on Zoom, Councillor to be Alfano, but I assume you're up there somewhere. So I, I will swear you in from the screen, okay? This doesn't get you off the hook for coming and signing the big book, though. Happy to. I have the big book. Okay. So there are two oaths, um, because Vermont doesn't trust you with just one. I think you have to really mean it. Um, so if you would raise your right hand. Oh, do you prefer to swear to God or affirm under the pains and penalties of perjury? Do you have a problem? I will affirm. Okay. Do you solemnly affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the constitution or government thereof under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Do you solemnly affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of council member for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons to the best of your judgment and ability according to law under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do so affirm. You are officially sworn. Sworn at. <laughs> all right. Number one and another one. Like, they get down in the well. So. Oh, we'll go down there. That's not right. And and get the mic. Oh, I can bark really loud. Can I can I spit it? So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you prefer to swear or affirm, or should I put them both in? Put them both. All right. You're both in there. Okay. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution or government thereof? So help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of council member for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons to the best of your judgment and ability according to law? So help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. You're sworn. We'll get you in the big book maybe after the meeting so we're not slowing down because the big book doesn't mean anything. It's just cool. <laughs> <laughs> So Lauren and Helen too. Um, oh, right. You all are. We can do it individually. We're not brand new anymore. So that's the thing. See if you can forget. Okay. Again. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution or government thereof? So help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury. Do. do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of council member for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons to the best of your judgment and ability according to law? So help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. I do. Are you all are I think you're both in the big book already. I remember signing that. Are you? Okay. Well, we've got to get you in the big book. <laughs> I heard it's cool. It <laughs> Almost the gold button. <laughs> Very close. Right for the big screen. Swear affirm both. Okay. 
Do you solemnly affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution or government thereof under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Do you solemnly affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of mayor for the city of Montpelier and will therein do equal right and justice to all persons, as to your judgment and ability according to law, under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really want to swear something. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'll call the meeting to order, and we have two members who are appearing remotely, so I'd ask them to identify themselves. I'm Carrie Brown. I'm a uh, counselor from District 3. I'm Sal Alfano. I'm a new counselor from District 2. Great. Thank you. Before we get started, I just want to make a couple of uh, comments. I am grateful for uh, the support and confidence that the voters have placed in me. And I'm grateful to uh, the, the other candidates who uh, ran for mayor for the uh, way the campaign was conducted. I want to congratulate and welcome our two members and congratulate and welcome back our two returning members. I think I appreciate everyone's dedication to the city. And I also want to appreciate everybody who ran for office, whether they were elected or not. It uh, It takes a lot to make the decision to put yourself before the voters to uh, expose your ideas to the public and to uh, take the chance that you will either uh, be supported or not supported by the voters. And uh, and I think it was, there was considerable amount of interest in, in the election this year. And, uh, and I appreciate e everyone participating in the process. We've had years where we've had hardly any contested elections. And I think it's very healthy to have uh, people contesting and running for every office to really make uh, give democracy a chance to work. So thank you all. And I'll call the meeting to order. I'll mention uh, a few logistics. If anyone is joining remotely, please indicate on your screen uh, your name so that uh, we know who's who's addressing us. Anyone who is uh, <clears throat> called upon to speak, please state your name and, and where you live. We ask that, that everyone keep their comments to two minutes or less. And if you're speaking about a specific agenda item, please keep your uh, comments germane to that topic. Anyone who wishes to speak must be recognized by the mayor. And uh, if you have multiple questions or comments, please state them all at the same time. Anyone who speaks out of turn goes goes over or uh, speaks of uh, on germane topics that are not germane to the subject may be uh, asked to address uh, to adjust their comments. And uh, and that's it. First item up before us is to approve the agenda. You've all seen and received the agenda. Are there uh, any changes that anyone wants wants to propose? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Next item on the agenda is <clears throat> general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic not on tonight's agenda. Uh, comments are limited to two minutes and in length and uh, Councillor Bate will assist us with timekeeping. Um, I see Peter Kelman's hand up, so we'll start with you, Peter. Uh, thanks, Jack. Um, I'm going to run slightly over two minutes. I'll tell you just that ahead of time. Um, as a Montpelier resident and the author publisher of Penn, the Montpelier Public Engagement Newsletter, I'd like to welcome our newly elected mayor, Jack McCullough, and newly elected city council members, Tim Heaney from District 3 and Sal Alfano from District 2. The residents of Montpelier owe all of you, our fellow residents, a real debt of gratitude for being willing and able to put in the time and effort required to carry out 
the substantial responsibilities of being a city council member or mayor. At the same time, as our constituents, we expect you, our duly elected public servants, to exercise your due diligence and fiduciary responsibility to oversee the efforts of the city manager and the departments that report to him and to hold them accountable for results, not just good efforts. We are looking to you, the mayor and city council, to lead thoughtfully, creatively, and equitably as together our community faces some enormous challenges, repeated infrastructure problems affecting city residents, a housing crisis at all levels, especially for workforce and lower income folks, the imminent sales of most buildings on the College of uh, Vermont College of Fine Arts campus, the evolving plans for the now city owned country club road site, taxpayer uncertainty about the impact of property value assessments, the specter of significantly increasing homelessness in our community, increasing municipal and school district budgets and their impact on property taxes and more. In addressing these and other issues, we are looking to you to ensure that our city government will be more proactive in matters such as the city's loss of VCFA and NECI, be more accountable for planning and implementation of ways to successfully address critical needs such as affordable housing and resilient long-term water, sewer, and traffic infrastructure, and will communicate with the public more effectively and with greater clarity and transparency, especially by explaining in a timely manner and in plain language the many technical, financial, and legal matters that we as residents are asked to approve by vote, such as budgets and bond issues, or those that you as city councilors are required to approve like city contracts, large equipment and other purchases, and the approval of various infrastructure improvement plans. Once again, I wanna thank you all for all you do and hoping that you will lead the city to be successful in meeting the many challenges that we will face over the next several years. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And you were well within the two minutes, well done. Um, <laughs> I forgot to introduce myself, Peter Kalman, Six uh, Mountain View. <laughs> thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I just saw the yellow sign and I'm going to see exactly two minutes. We're going to change. No, no, I'm the, not. The one minute usually goes up at two minutes. So most people have at least three minutes, often four. Ah, thank you. Okay. I don't see anyone else with a hand raised uh, online. Um, Steve Whitaker, are you uh, seeking to be recognized? Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, I can't do it as quite as nice and polished as Peter, but I wanted to cover some of the same things. You will, especially you know, new members of the council, will see I'll petition to get certain things on the agenda or requested certain things on the agenda that you may have heard before, but I'm counting on the new composition of the council to begin to hold the manager accountable uh, for those. We have a new mayor who served on the police review committee uh, who helped suppress the information of the lying, thieving, harassment, and even killing uh, that was swept under the rug and not included in the police review committee report. So th those are real serious issues that need to be debated. The public records access issues, the flagrant violation, recurring flagrant violation uh, of the city to public records requests. Uh, I'm going to change topic. Engineered by our city manager in meetings that were not open to the public was this effort to dissolve Central Vermont Public Safety Authority and move to withdraw. That has been even that process of voting to prepare a plan to dissolve and voting has been bungled. So you've got an invalid process going on that is reckless. You've got, I believe that one of the city appointed members told me today that he's gonna re resign, but Donna and Doug Hoyt have timed out. They're, they're term limited, thank God. They can't wreak havoc there anymore. But there's a need to reinvigorate that council, even if it's only for a time period 
required to do dissolution, to pay the bills, to manage the money, to manage litigation. Those cannot be just left to, you know, the manipulations of your city mismanager. You, you've got to get engaged. You have to understand that we are a, a member. We Montpelier is a member, as is Barry City. And that process has been totally bungled with a conflict of interest to try to entrench or preserve the cash revenue and defeat oversight of the current dispatching operation. So you will hear more about it. I would encourage you to ask and educate yourselves, probably offline. It's less, uh, quote, combative, uh, which I have never been. I've been critical, but I haven't been combative, despite what Digger says. So plowing, ice and snow, we keep moving our cars back and forth and our public works does not plow. So I'm having to park, you know, a, several feet into the roadway because, you know, they have a nice warm day and all the trucks driving by on Main Street and they don't plow. So what's up with that? What, why are we paying for this service in this department? And why are we moving our cars for this ordinance if you're not going to do your part? And it's, I shouldn't have to say that again and again and again, but that's on you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other member of the public who wishes to address the council? All right, we'll move on to the next agenda item, the consent agenda. Just really quickly, it was my best intent to get you all minutes and liquor license stuff, but I just was too wiped out the last week. So I will owe you a lot for next time. So we do not have minutes. We do not have oh, liquor license. We so do not have them. Oh and, uh, <clears throat> and none of the businesses are... Uh, are facing any tr trouble by uh, not having their liquor licenses issued? No, uh, there's a whole new process with that. And I actually have to wait till I get money from them before I can approve them anyways. Mm -hmm. um, we're all working. Okay. <laughs> okay. So is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Make a motion we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, move and second to approve the consent agenda. The only items being items C and D. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Can I make a comment? Yes. I would just like to thank staff, Bill, and who uh, and the others who did the loan. It really changed how much we we're paying in interest. And gives us options to go longer or less time. So I just, it's one of the consent agenda items. I just wanted to not acknowledge we have it because our staff is always looking out for us. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is to elect officers. And the officers we are electing starts with the council president. Yes. I would like to nominate. Lauren, I would happily run for that. Someone give me a second. Second. All right. Are there any other nominations? All right. All those in big favor of electing Councilor Pearl to be Council President, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. This could be awkward. <laughs> All right. Now, I don't actually have a list. Vice president is next. Yes. Is there a nomination for vice president? I would nominate Donna to be vice president. You're willing Second. to do it? Sure. Oh, sorry. Sure. Okay. Any other nominations? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and now aye. to elect a parliamentarian. Carrie, are you willing? I am willing, yes, okay. thank I, you. I nominate Carrie Brown. Second. Okay. And any other nominations? All right, all those in favor of Carrie Brown, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. For the benefit of the public, those of you that are watching at home and even the new members, um, the president serves as the uh, 
as acting mayor when the mayor is not available or runs the meeting when the mayor. So that is so that as we've seen, uh, former council president McCullough was running the meetings after Mayor Watson resigned. Uh, often will appear for the mayor if the mayor's out of town at a ribbon cutting, those kind of things. The vice president similarly performs those duties if the mayor and the president are not available. And the parliamentarian uh, is the ha, does have the final say in the meeting about any parliamentary disputes or helps us sort out parliamentarian. And I think we also decided that if the mayor, president, and vice president were all missing, the parliamentarian would run the meeting as well. Um, so that's what the, that is what those jobs are for those that are interested. All right, and the rules of uh, our uh, our documents indicate that the rules of parliamentary procedure are governed by the most recent uh, edition of Robert's Rules of Order, which at present is twelfth edition. Next up, rules of procedure. Is the plan here to just readopt them, or just to it's up to you? Okay, <laughs> they're your rules of procedure. We have the rules we of procedure. We usually adopt them every so. I will say this before you go on to the next few things. We typically adopt a rules of procedure, ethics policy, and the standard and groups norms each year, even though they're often the same ones as the prior year. The idea is that this particular group of seven as a group has adopted them as their rules for this year. So they're not just, you know, it's clear that everyone had a chance to read them, to vote on them. Uh, and I was going to mention when we got there, but since I have the mic, I'll say it right now. I will note, uh, not that I have any problem with the standards and group norms, but I would say that those were developed. I think Councilmember Bate may be the only one left from the time that those were developed. So if, you know, it, I just toss out that if the council would like to have some sort of retreat or whatever to talk about those kinds of things, we could do that. If you don't, that's fine as well. But I do want to mention that they go back to a couple of, a couple of mayors ago. I just wanted to comment further. I wanted to comment like Bill, I feel we need to adopt the procedures and maybe norms, but we need to then amend them as we get to know one another. We have a new council and I definitely want us to have a retreat. I feel it's really been something I've missed to have a real serious retreat. And, and the, the current rules of procedure that's in your packets were initially adopted in 1963 and amended several times over the years since then. And I would entertain a motion to, uh, well, nope. let me, I'll, uh, I'll I, uh, entertain a motion to adopt the rules of procedure as they've been uh, circulated. So moved. Is there a second? Second. And is there any discussion? Okay, um, sorry, did I see, uh, Steve, do you have a comment? Yeah them prior and I didn't highlight them um, but there's something in there about the time allowed and it's it's a 10 minute allocation and I continue to protest and think it's unreasonable that uh, I think you need some discussion around this issue of whether two minutes is adequate especially when someone who anyone who is informed and is bringing up multiple issues each of which could necessitate two minutes of to adequately inform you of what's going on or what's going wrong. And so if you've given yourself 10 minutes to talk about those items, uh, I, you might know which clause that's in. I couldn't find it. It's number not eight. Which, and rule, it's, rule eight, yeah. Go ahead. Matt. Well, it's number eight and it actually says should, should be limited to no more than 10 minutes per subject unless extended by majority vote of the council. Yeah, I, I think that's a valid point worth discussing, Steve. You may recall that uh, last year I uh, made a different proposal for uh, for comments in, under general business and appearances, and at some point in the near future, I'll be uh, bringing that up again. Thanks. Any further discussion of the rules of procedure? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion is passed and we have adopted the rules of procedure. Next up, we have the ethics policy. And again, this is a 
policy adopted by the city council initially in 1999 and uh, generally re it's been reaffirmed annually. Is there a motion to adopt this, uh, the ethics policy? I move we adopt the ethics policy. Is there a second? second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, any discussion among the council first? I see uh, Linda Berger, I see you have your hand up. So I'll recognize you now. Thank you. I'm Linda Berger. I live on Lower State Street. Um, I believe that there's an omission in the ethics policy, which is there isn't any mention about conduct towards the general public. And uh, could, you, could you tell me what, what you mean by that? Um, I've looked at other ethics policies from different um, councils across the country, and they have a section about conduct towards the general public by the council members. And what does it tend to say? It tends to, <laughs> it tends to say that the public should be treated with respect. I think it has also to do, I think in our case, it could relate to the amount of time people are given to speak, how they're cut off or not cut off, how the comments or the information that people and the public are trying to present is um, listened to or the, the perception of how it's listened to by the public. Okay, I think what you're talking about is more along the lines of council policies and standards and group norms, which. Uh, which we do have uh, next on the agenda. I, the point is taken, but I think the ethics policy really is uh, intended more towards our ethical obligations as uh, fiduciaries of, uh, of the okay. public. It's also addressed, I think, in the code of conduct that was adopted this past year. And actually we, we should have put that on the agenda. We'll do that for the next meeting mm -hmm. to reaffirm that because uh, that talks specifically about that. Steve. Uh, thank you, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. The uh, ethics policy, I think it's easier to talk about the ethics policy now that it's not directly pointed at any council member because of a term limited expiration of, but when you've got a conflict of interest, when, when the city's council's obligations towards preserving revenue for the city dispatch operation is in conflict with a effort to create a regional, fair, equitable, transparent system, you, you need to acknowledge that conflict or the, the members do. And because you to just continue to ignore and pretend it doesn't exist is, is corrosive. It's, it, it actually corrupts the process. And, and we've, this is what has crippled Central Vermont Public Safety Authority is not only mismanagement in, in the, uh, by the officers, but this idea that we're trying to preserve working for two bosses, work for a boss that says, you got to get rid of this thing. You know, Brian Pete put it in an email six or eight months ago. We're going to try to dissolve CVPSA once we get this grant locked in. But also the, the falsities that are in the town report that were representing the fact, the events of recent years for public safety authority, that can't be allowed. Nobody vetted that for truth. You just took somebody's word for it and nobody, even other board members could have told you that's not true, that's not true. I've been talking to the Department of Public Safety and there's many things that are not true in that. So how do you, how do you resolve the ethics of your own behavior of, I mean, the ethics of saying that, you know, we didn't violate a public record law, I'm, I'm gonna sweep it under the, law, the, the rug. That, that's unethical, especially for an attorney. So I, I'm raising these issues because you need to really examine and police yourselves and do it publicly and in a transparent way. But acknowledging these ethical conflicts is the place to start. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I uh, read the ethics uh, policy, uh, one of the things that strikes me is that the definition of uh, of a conflict of interest really is uh, whether a, a public official has uh, has a potential to receive either a direct or indirect financial benefit from the uh, 
from any action coming before the public body and any action that the public official might take. And I just, it hasn't come up maybe at all in the, uh, uh, in the time I've been on council or just a very few times. Um, I, and I just caution people that there, there are two sides of the ethics policy. One is clearly we're not allowed to take action that has a potential for directly or indirectly financially benefiting us. But also I, I caution people to not be too quick to say you have a conflict of interest because anytime you recuse yourself, that also means that the people do not have the benefit of your participation in the decision. Um, and so those are both parts of the, uh, both considerations for uh, ethics questions. Is there any other discussion before we vote on the uh, ethics policy? Hearing none, all those in favor? Wait, I, I, I'm sorry, I have one quest, clarifying question. Oh, sure yep. Um, do I understand that boards and commissions uh, are also under the ICMA code of ethics? So, uh, I could jump you in. can answer that. Boards, oh, yeah. boards and commissions follow the city's ethics policy. The ICMA code of ethics only applies to the city manager. That's the International City Managers Association. It's a code of ethics for city managers, and I try to apply it to our staff. But it does. It's not. That it has have nothing to do with the council or other commissions. But but yes, boards are subject to the ethics policy. Just to give an example, if you're on the uh, development review board. And uh, and you or your neighbor are proposing an improvement to your property, you couldn't vote on your own permit, that kind of thing. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? All right, we have readopted the ethics policy. Next up, we have our statement of standards, uh, general policies and council policies and standards and group norms, which was adopted first in 2017 and revised once since then. Um, is there a motion to adopt these? So moved. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Is there, is there any discussion? I, I have one suggestion uh, and it's in line with what uh, with what Donna just said. Uh, in the in the list of group norms, you know, in in the lead up to the election, I uh, received communications from, you know, in the last several months, I received communications from people saying that they they may not have, uh, you know, they might have sent us email emails to members of the council and not gotten prompt responses, and I think that people are entitled to expect uh, that if we get we're going to respond to what their concerns are. So I would suggest that we add a statement that we would strive to respond promptly and respectfully to communications from the public. Everybody willing to add that? It all depends on how you define prompt. Life has a lot of challenges. Yes, and that's why I didn't say <laughs> within 48 hours or any fixed term. Yeah. I would and, say respond. I just the prompt just makes me think. Oh my heavens! Some weeks. <laughs> yeah, I I hear you. Yeah, I I don't I not I haven't been perfect on doing this either. I don't think anyone is. So okay, so we okay with adding that? Can we see it in written? I can't hear you. Can we see it in written form before saying yes or no? Is it? Yeah, is I it okay. Get, I can get it to people next time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll take this up Thank next you. time. Okay. Next, we are to. But we need to vote on the one that exists. Um, we just wait until next time, and then we'll have. Okay. okay. Yeah. Without without objection, we'll lay this on the table. <laughs> All right. Committee assignments. You all have uh, the list of the current uh, committee assignments um, for members of the public who are watching. Um, one of the things that comes with being on the council is uh, 
serving on a whole range of, of committees. And uh, so the time we spend here in the room is not all, all the work uh, we're doing. And with a lot of turnover, what, what I've noticed is that there's a lot of people, there's a lot of committees who don't have any council representatives now because they're, they're gone. Um, and, and this is the current list, Kelly. Okay, great. So we have the Americans with Disabilities Act Committee. I'll just see anyone want to volunteer to be on that. This is one of the few committees that meets during uh, business hours. Can we just say the ones that we want first, then we can decide which are which are left? <laughs> is it better? Because I have two, two you know, eight. committees in my mind, but I want to help uh -huh. the city and city council to support with other committees. Sure. But that I is. don't know how much time I have to spend doing sure. business uh, day. So that's why uh -huh. you Caring? can put our names and see. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Gary. I see. You. Yes. Um, I had just a a quick correction to what it says here. Great. Um, so it has me on the Montpelier Alive board, which I do not believe that I'm on that board. And it does not have me on the housing committee, which I am on. Mm -hmm. So we should just make that quick change. And then um, the restroom committee is not on here, which is another one that I have been going to and would like to be on. Okay. Can I this line? Well, I can... just Donna, I think Donna has another correction. So let's get it. Yes. I mean, some time ago, I resigned from the Community Justice Center and the Citizen Advisory Board because they changed their schedule. Uh -huh. And there are some others missing. I, I don't, maybe I'm not seeing it. Montpelier Infrastructure Committee? Um, trans transportation. Oh, I see on the bottom. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a complete streets committee. Yeah. There are lots of committees. Some these are, the, I think, the ones that had council reps. Although I've actually, I noticed we have the solid waste district, which you have a council appointment. But we appoint yep. The citizen. Mm -hmm. to you. Yeah, Donna. Or sorry, Lauren. Sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering. Like I, I know when I first started, I, I signed up for a couple committees, and they ended up being at times that I just could never do, and felt bad. Like I'm wondering if we could maybe get the schedule and look at it for the next meeting so that we can actually make sure that there are meetings that we can do. Like sometimes during the day I could do, but oftentimes I couldn't. So I'm just not sure what I could okay. commit to yet. Okay. Um, so do you want to just put this off completely until next time? Laura? Maybe. And I mean, I trying to think of an open meeting law compliant, if there's a way to like send our initial thoughts or something to the city manager so that there's some like starting place so, or we could see where just gaps are just sending their requests because uh, then we could kind of see and for everybody we don't either. point so we just make yeah it could be like yeah. just give us a starting interested. place and then we could come back with a master schedule of when they meet make sure this double check these and see if there's anything we missed and then we take it up the next meeting. we'd be happy to do that okay so can i at least announce the ones that i am interested sure. in Okay, so um, in our last CJ meeting, um, Carol mentioned about community justice center. So I want to be, um, you know, in their meetings. Mm -hmm. And also I want to um, be in the Montpelier Alive board and homelessness task force. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so we'll have this on for our next uh, agenda of our next meeting. Anyone submit so your Jack? Jack? What's the term? Oh, Sal, sorry, I didn't see you. Um, so I, I like Lauren's idea. So, Bill, the idea is that we'll send you committees that were, everyone will send you committees and you'll have them on a spreadsheet or something, and we'll be able to then see where, where there's um, duplicates and where there's uh, empty, empty right. seats. Okay, great, thank you. Great. 
Anybody else want to say anything before we move on? Okay, great, thank you. Next item on our agenda, we have uh, appointments to the Energy Advisory Committee. And we have, sorry, did some, was someone Excuse trying to- Excuse me, Jack? Yes. Uh, could, could I just go back one? Um, sure. Will we, will we know which, uh, which committees, when, when they meet? Is there a, is there a, is there a time schedule somewhere? We'll, we'll put that together. Okay, that, that'll help, I think, in some cases. I, I can do, for example, non-business hours more than some, so. Donna. Well, uh, I'm just going to tell Sal, if you have some that you're interested in, go to the website and find when they meet. Yeah, okay. You can certainly do that. We'll put we'll together we'll a master can, list can for, for Friday's packet anyway. Okay, so. great. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready to move on to the uh, Energy Advisory Committee? We have uh, We have two applicants, and they are... Amanda Sardonis and Chris Lefla, and I'm trying to see if they are present. Um, I am not. I'm sorry, there's a different name listed on the agenda sheet, a Casey Dean. Hmm. And then there's these two that have separate applications. Am I reading the wrong one? Yeah. If you go to the council committee, I'm not sorry, the MEC appointment cover sheet, I only see a, a Casey Dean there. Mm -hmm. Huh. Right. And there are two different folks. There are, there are th three, three names there. Casey Dean is the first, but there's no application for Casey Dean. And then there are two other applicants with full applications. I'm wondering if this is an old one. We may. Casey's been coming to the meetings. I believe she already was appointed. Right. Um, so I think that was, probably was the last we might time. We reuse the old cover sheet or not updated the names. It'd be my guess, but we can also delay this, I think, for two weeks to be sure. Yeah. What, why don't we do that? Yeah. Okay. And next up, we have a possible appointment to the Community Fund Board. And there's one applicant, Dan Groberg, and um, I am not seeing Dan. Carrie, your hand is up. Is that from last time? No, I wanted to um, move that we appoint Dan Groberg. I'll second it. Okay. Um, is there any discussion? Okay. Yes, Steve. I want to go on record as opposing that appointment. This, I think most of y'all are not aware, but what really happened when the public toilet signs went in the planners is Dan Groberg organized a, a Facebook flash mob and it all came out in court and it, there was no conviction. But basically, this is a person who's embedded with the merchants and facilitating their agenda, even to the point of getting four or five of them to come into court and perjure themselves. This is really not the kind of person of ethical integrity that, I mean, and there's a good paper trail. This was done through discovery and evidence, and and I'm happy to provide it. But I would ask you to postpone action and seek some other members to that board, uh, because the, this is a very important passing money out to your to your friends and your you know, people who com complicit in your perjury uh, and, you know, false charges against people, that's that's not the kind of people we need to keep appointing to boards. Okay. Any uh, other discussion from mem among members of the council? Ready to vote? All those in favor of, of appointing Dan Groberg, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, we've appointed Dan Grober to the community fund. We have <clears throat> an appointment to the Conservation Commission. And uh, Paige Girton is seeking reappointment. And I don't see Paige in the meeting either. Donna. Paige does really good work. I'd like to nominate her to be reappointed. Yeah, I agree. Second. Uh, not moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Sal, were you seeking to speak or just voting? I, I wanted to, to uh, point out that she, she asks for a, um, to, to be named an alternate member. I, I don't know the significance of that, but she was saying that she resigned, but she had a grant that she wanted to complete and wanted to be named an alternate member. I'm not sure why she you know, sought that designation, but um, I just wanted to point point that out. Because uh, I, I wasn't sure, that, you know, why it was important. We do have alternates on the Conservation Commission, so you could point her to that position. You're right. That is what she yep. sought. So can we can we amend the motion to name her as an alternate member? Yeah, that's fine. Without objection, we'll uh, order that. All right. All those in favor of appointing Paige Girton as an alternate to the... Uh, Conservation Commission signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? All right. And we have uh, appointed Paige Girton as an alternate to the Conservation Commission. Next on the agenda is the presentation for City Council orientation. Um, do you have an estimate of how long this is going to be? Could be a long time, <laughs> but at 830, we'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Never the break time. Yeah, it looks like it could be a long time, but and build these slides are available for so anyone who wants to download them on the city's web page. Okay. I'm going to point to that now to find anything Showing up on the screen. Yep. Yes. Okay. Great. I'll just kind of put this out higher. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, best practice in my profession is to uh, help orient, particularly one council member, really an entire council. Uh, when they come in. However, the way it's set up in most communities is there's some lag time between the time there's an election and the time that people actually take office. And in Vermont, of course, you get elected and that night you bid, or in this case, the meeting is the next night. Um, but given the fact that we have two brand new council members, a person serving as mayor new and a, a council member who's only been with us a couple months, council member Brown's only been with us for a year, and uh, we haven't really done this in a full public session for a while. We thought it'd be a good idea to uh, go through a big overview of your roles and, and those sorts of things. And also we have the departments here to give a very brief presentation about what's going on with them. So uh, we do expect this to fill up some time. This isn't a short presentation. Um, I will give you the, the bad news is you will have to listen to me talk a lot. Uh, you will have to, you're going to hear a lot of terms and get a lot of information um, thrown at you. The good news is there's not a quiz at the end, and um, all of it is available to you in other forms, including the handbook and things that you get. So this is not the only place, and you will have this thing. But it, the idea is that if nothing else, you hear a term, and if it comes up again, you say, I heard something about this. This is something I should pay attention to. So, uh, 
with that said, we'll get started. So first of all, welcome you all to the city council and thank you for serving. Uh, this is the Athenian oath from ancient e a Athens. And while it's not the oath that you all took for city council, perhaps it should be. Um, I'm not gonna read all of it, you can see it, uh, but it is really, uh, again, a guiding principle that those of us in my profession use. And I think the last one that I, I highlighted was, thus in all ways, we will transmit the city not only uh, not less, but greater and more beautiful to us than that was when transmitted to us. So as you all have taken the reins of this community, uh, your oath, your your goal should be to make it better by the time that you leave and that we will do right by the public at all times. So today we're going to go through five separate things. Some are longer than others. We're going to talk about sort of the mechanics of governance, uh, the roles of city government, uh, how policy making looks from your perspective, uh, an overview of city uh, operations departments and facilities, and then a quick summary of some of the active projects. There'll be question times at the end of each section about those sections and then an overall questions at the end of the presentation. So we don't, uh, so you don't have to hold your questions for everything. So governance, um, who knows what Dylan's rule means? Okay, someone that hasn't been on the council All right, Councilmember Hurl. It means if we want to change our city charter, we have to get it approved by the legislature. Correct. So there are two types of states in the United States: uh, home rule states and Dillon's rule states. And about forty of them, including Vermont, are Dillon's rule. And what that means is that a town or city does not have the authority to do anything unless it's expressly granted to them by the state government. So, despite the fact that we all think of Vermont as a home rule state with town meeting and all that stuff, we are actually, like most other states, uh, tethered to the state government. So I think that's just a very important thing to understand. Um, when people say, can't the city just do something? Sometimes you can't. If we have not been authorized to do it, we can't do it. Um, so we have our city charter, uh, which you shall have available. That is enacted by the legislature. So, um, and what uh, what any charter does, is creates variations from the general statute. So it gives certain authorities or certain procedures or certain variations from what all, applies to all cities and towns. And there are, you know, most large communities have their own charter, uh, but that's ours. We operate what's under what is known very commonly around the country as a council manager form of government. Uh, basically all larger communities of Vermont, except Burlington and Rutland use this form of government. We'll talk a lot more about that as we go on. But the city council is the legislative or governing body. And I use those terms because uh, when you look at statute, you will see references to those terms of the, you know, the, when the governing body meets or the legislative body. That, that's referring to you or a select board. If you look at something in statute, if it's not in the charter, it talks about the select board, that's still the city council. And the city council is the mayor and the six city council members. So the seven of you together comprise the city council. So just to be clear, some people think the mayor is somehow not a council member. That's not correct. Uh, and the authority, any authority of any of you come from the council as a whole. So while we certainly will meet with all of you and talk with all of you and want to know what you're interested in that kind of thing, unless unless the council has voted it or said it as a group, um, it's not an action of the council. And similarly, it takes four votes to pass anything. And you would think that's simple when there are seven of you here. Of course, it takes four votes. But if there's only four of you here, it takes four votes. So it's not a majority who's present. It's a majority of the body. So just something to remember. So even at, I think at our last meeting, we had a vote. It was 3-2. And it was like, well, the, the council president needs to act to make a fourth vote. Otherwise, it's otherwise it would have been defeated, even though it had a 3-2 majority. Uh, so there's that. So the city council... Uh, only appoints a handful of individuals. So you appoint the city manager, the city treasurer, city attorney, and then various boards and committee members. And then there's a long list of those. And we'll talk a little bit more of that. And then the city manager is the chief administrative officer of the city or the council. Again, more on those when we get to roles. So let's talk about the mayor since they are different. Um, they are a city council member. They preside over council meetings and um, what is somewhat unique in Montpelier is the mayor may veto an action of the council as long as they do so before the start of the next council meeting. Um, and it, that veto may be overridden 
uh, by five votes. Um, it has happened very sparingly during my time here. I don't believe Mayor Watson ever exercised it. I'm not sure Mayor Holler ever exercised it. I think maybe Mayor Hooper once or twice, Mayor Caparis maybe once. So really not, not a frequently used um, thing, but it is there. The mayor uh, votes to break a tie or make a fourth vote. And I'd like to be clear, this is not by charter, not by state law. Uh, the mayor could vote on every item. It's been by tradition and practice here in Montpelier as how the mayor's uh, voted, so to speak. So I don't, it's fine, it works, but just to be noted. I think one thing that differentiates the mayor is that they are the only citywide elected official on the council. And as such, I think are viewed as the sort of political leader of the community and you know a spokesman for the community and on, and and as such generally serve as a spokesperson uh, even in times of emergencies when we have staff handling things we'll generally get the mayor involved and you know have them talk to the cameras talk to the community people want to see the person that they voted for um you know, communicating with them and and if something unusual happens there are a very tiny bit of a few appointments that are the mayors i think uh say the T.W. Wood Gallery, that maybe the investment committee, there's a couple, there's a couple that are the mayors only, but it's not that many. Uh, the mayor can, I should have put it in, they can have mayoral proclamations. There's that. And, um, and, but they don't have any real administrative authority. And I think that's just important for people to understand. I know most of you in this room know that, but sometimes I think people assume the mayor has more uh, operational authority uh, than they do. So the council structure, we'll go through a little bit of the structure. You've just already done the first part of this. You've elected your president, vice president, and parliamentarian, and I've already explained what those are. And you've adopted most of the next things. One thing that is important is that any council member may add an agenda item. So that includes the mayor. I think, again, there's, a, there's a, uh, some misperception that only the mayor makes the agenda. Actually, if you look at the charter, the charter says the city manager will prepare an agenda for uh, the council. Uh, but it, our, our rules and our charter says that any council member, and in fact, any resident can add an agenda item by request. So uh, the council may create committees, subcommittees, and or, and or appoint a council rep to other committees and also establish a charge and deadline for committees. That's often how the council does work. So they'll say, we're going to create a task force or we're going to create a group. This is what we'd like you to do. Here's the deadline we give you. This is the report we'd like to see in such such time. Typically, the regular meetings of the council are on the second and fourth Wednesday of the month. That does change from time to time. It typically changes at the holiday season because the fourth Wednesday is usually the night before Thanksgiving and the fourth Wednesday in December is usually right around Christmas. So we often move those to the third. Typically in the summer, we drop at least one meeting in one of the months um, and sometimes two, depending on what's on our docket. And sometimes just because of people's schedules, we will choose to change, but, but generally it's the second or fourth meeting. You will get a weekly memo uh, on Fridays from my office, uh, from all the departments talking about issues that have happened, various activities, status of certain activities. And at the end of it is uh, sort of a laid out schedule of upcoming council meetings so people can see at least the tentative schedule for items that are coming. And it's usually two or three months out. So people can see what we're thinking of what's in the queue. And obviously any of you are invited to ask, communicate with me at any time if you have any questions about that. And then the council engages in annual strategic planning. And I'm gonna talk about that later. So I'll let that go right now. So we're in the middle of a council meeting now. This is kind of a typical council meeting. So we will start, you get the weekly memo and the agenda by email on Fridays. Uh, that comes with cover sheets. We'll talk about that. We then go over the provisions for remote or hybrid meetings, which um, Mayor McCullough did already. And uh, But the basic part of that is the most fundamental rule is if you are a council member, if you're a member of the council and you are participating remotely as council member Brown and council member Alfano are tonight, you must identify yourself at the beginning of the meeting um, remotely. So that people hear your voice, they know who you are, they know you're speaking, that you're a member of the council. So that's why that's on there. We have an agenda review, it's usually approved, uh, and that's the time that things can be added if necessary or changed in order uh, or taken off, uh, but just making sure that the agenda that's been published is, is still good to go. 
Uh, again, we're already part way into this. We have general business and appearances, and this is when individuals from the community can address the council on issues that are not on the agenda. They can raise subject of concern. They can make an announcement. They can do whatever they want within the allowed time. The consent agenda is uh, usually tonight was small, but sometimes it will have contracts, bid, awards, any number of things, any number of items, and it's really meant to be items that are non-controversial, somewhat administrative in nature, but because of their size or their whatever, they need to be approved by the city council. Any one member of the council can pull an item off the consent agenda if they want to talk about it, ask about it. So uh, it's there for convenience. It's not there to avoid uh, anything other than uh, use our time wisely in a meeting. Um, urge you to, if you, if you, are, if you do have real detailed questions on a consent agenda, we appreciate it if you can get in touch with me or our staff early so that we can either be, you know, we can either answer your question for you or be prepared to answer it at the meeting. You know, I, we don't mind if you want to take it off. That's your right. It's really uh, a nice courtesy if uh, the mayor calls me and says, Bill, I'm going to pull item C off the consent agenda. Can you be prepared to speak to it or have your staff with you? And that way, you get the answer you want, public gets to hear it, and um, so there's that. Public hearings, uh, so then we move on to just regular agenda items. Those are, there'll be a topic, there will be uh, a cover sheet that goes with it. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, and typically the council will, the item will get framed. The council may uh, allow public comment, typically does, um, but it isn't required. Um, and uh, then we'll at some point cut off public comment and have a council discussion, motion, and make a decision about what happens. And that's that will whatever that action is will guide the follow up. There are also public hearings. There are certain uh, some grants require them. Uh, we have them for the budget. We have them for bonds. Ordinances require public hearings, zoning, those kinds of things. So those actually require a specific part where a public hearing is opened and the public can speak and offer their comments. And typically at that point, the council just listens to the public comment and then closes the public comment section and then goes on to the council portion of the discussion. Um, at the end of the meeting, we have what's called council reports and each of you will be given the opportunity to say whatever you want really. Uh, and you are certainly welcome to pass, but it can be anything from, you know, today's my daughter's birthday to, um, you know, like to thank so and so for the, this or this group for doing such and such, or I, I think probably most appropriate is those, when you are on council committees, that's your chance to say, hey, the, the transportation committee met last week. And just so you know, they're going to be talking about this. Is, you know, give your fellow council members a heads up of what might be coming before them. And then lastly, uh, we have executive sessions from time to time. There's a very limited set of reasons for which you can go into executive session. And we follow those, and they're usually for appointments, personnel issues, or some sort of negotiations, uh, perhaps a land purchase or uh, labor negotiations, those kind of things. Um, we spend our practice to try to use them as only when necessary, and uh, obviously in, in line with the law. So we talked about the cover sheet. Uh, you will see these in your agenda when you get your agenda for each item, and they are pretty self-explanatory. You will have the subject, the submitting dark department, and the staff's recommended action, and then it will try to relate it to a prior goal or a strategic plan, tell you how, how much money is needed, where the money is coming from, if there's any law, legal requirements that are relate to it. Uh, and any other background information, if there's an attached document, it, you know, it might say memo from the EW director or something like that. And then we just try to do our best to think who might be interested parties and we will reach out to them. But so, so, you know, council has a sense of who might be showing up at the meeting or who they may want to talk to about it. Uh, it might say Montpelier Live or downtown businesses or something. And so a council member might say, well, I think I'll take it upon myself to go talk to them and see what they think about this. And then uh, it's uh, electronically signed. We, we, we actually do need to, it's supposed to, our, our rule is if, if it's not signed, it still got submitted, but it means I didn't see it and sign off on it. If it is signed, it means I did. We've gotten sloppy about that. So one of our new year's, new council year's resolutions is to get back to that. So you know whether it's actually gone past my desk or Kelly's desk or not. Uh, so. 
So some things that are important. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just going to call these out. These are things you should become acquainted with. Uh, and all of this, I think, is in your handbook or available also, but just the open meeting law, number one. We operate under the open meeting law, and uh, we do our best to follow it. And um, so just make sure that you know. And included in the open meeting law are the allowed reasons for executive sessions. And there are some parts of executive sessions that require two votes. You have to, we actually have to find a, have a finding that any premature disclosure of the information would put the city at a disadvantage. So I think logically, um, like a land negotiation, say we were buying land from the Heenies. And you'd have, to refuse you'd have to refuse yourself, yes. But okay, so somebody else, uh, you know, and we, we have a meeting to say, well, you know, they're asking this, but we think they'd take this and we'll offer this, but we'd really be willing to pay this. Obviously, having all that conversation in public puts the city at a disadvantage in that kind of negotiation because the person. So, but we have to have a finding first. It says this. And then there are other executive sessions that don't require that finding. They just, you can just go in for those purposes. So those are all there. Public records law. Uh, Anything basically that you do or write in your role as a city official, email, text, uh, memo, anything like that is a public record. And virtually all of it is disclosable. There are some exemptions. Uh, and uh, But I think you should start with the assumption that you're creating a public record anytime you do that. There are rules for uh, providing public records. There's a, we have a link on the email for people uh, can uh, on, excuse me, on the website to make public records requests. We get them, we respond to them. And um, there's that. Agenda preparation, that usually goes on just so you know. We're usually into that, well into that by Thursday. And by Friday morning, we're wrapping it up. Um, we tell, generally, we close it off at Thursday, except for something that might come in from a council member or that kind of thing, or something really important from a department head. Um, but by Friday night, you're getting it late Friday afternoon, you're getting the agenda for the next week. So if you want something on agenda, please think about, say, Thursday before, you know, tomorrow. We don't have meeting next week, but if we did. Uh, and then um, so that's how that goes. Budget process, we'll talk about that later. Uh, just and knowing the annual election town meeting deadlines, there are certain things for deadlines for the budget, certain deadlines for charter changes, certain deadlines for uh, different things that you might do. So just know that those things exist you don't need to we have a year now uh and we'll you know we'll brief you on that again when the time comes but just be aware that there are things you can't just call a town meeting vote for next week 30-day warning period and public hearings and all that same thing with bonds uh there's a certain very specific process for bonds including a necessity resolution similar with charter change ordinance adoptions are laid out in the the, the um charter we use a two hearing process, two public hearing process that is not required by our charter or by state law. You can, you can actually adopt an ordinance just having one public reading and adopt it. We have, for as long as I've been here, held two readings. And I think it's a good process, frankly. I think it gives the public a chance to hear about it. Sometimes the council will make an amendment at the first one, bring it back to the second one. It just allows for good, uh, good process. Zoning is... Zoning has a very, even though it is also an ordinance, there's a very prescribed process for zoning amendments, bylaw amendments under state law. So it, it's different than our regular ordinance. I, I won't go into the deal, but just know that if we're changing zoning, it's not the same as a regular ordinance. And lastly, I know that when you all ran for election, you really ran because you wanted to be members of the Board of Civil Authority and the Board of Abatement. Um, and this was just your way of getting to those great jobs. But congratulations, you are all members of those two boards. And uh, you will be getting notices from uh, the city clerk from time to time about meetings. And those are important meetings. There's people that are requesting tax abatements and uh, you know voter lists and uh, you know, various things. Some of you could explain more of what they do. But you are, you are members and they need quorum. So you signed up. So yes. I'll, I'll just point out that uh, because we're going through a townwide reappraisal, that that's uh, when people get their, their new assessment notices, they have the ability to appeal those assessments. And so typically in a year where we have townwide reappraisal, the uh, Board of Civil Authority is very busy because we have a lot of people challenging their assessments. One year we uh, started, 
uh, meetings on Thursday, August 21st, and we met every week from Thursday, from August 21st until end of October, maybe the beginning of November. So, yes. and this is a reappraisal year. So, <laughs> so I want to thank you for that. That's actually helpful and a good reminder that this is one of those years. I wanted to call out, um, we talk about the authority of the city council, city manager thing. There are certain um, positions and groups that have some independent authority, even though they fall within the city government structure. So I just wanted to call those out. Again, I won't go into huge detail, but the city clerk, you, so there's some that are elected. So there's the city clerk who uh, is in charge of elections, land records, um, licensing, that sort of thing. Uh, and you don't really have any say over them other than budget. Uh, they are an independent entity. I guess the only real control you have is amending the minutes that they prepare. Uh, the Cemetery Commission, likewise, and I, I know Patrick will talk about this more, they are separately elected uh, and separately chartered. The Parks Commission is part of the city charter, um, but they are independently elected and are given charge of sort of managing the parks. However, they don't have the authority to enact ordinances concerning the park. So some there's often interaction there where they want more teeth in a park rule and they might come to the council. So there is some overlap there, but they, they do have a fair amount of independence. And then as the Board of Civil Authority, Board of Abatement, I just mentioned, they have very clear authorities because it's not just you, it's also the justices of the pieces that are a part of those boards as well. So those groups have authority that are not just the council. There are then groups that are appointed by the council, the rec board uh, who advises the rec department, and even more importantly, the Development Review Board, Planning Commission, and Design Review Committee. You appoint them to perform these functions, but once you do, um, it's really inappropriate for you to interfere with their functions. So the Development Review Board is backed as a quasi-judicial process, and when they're holding a hearing, it's actually um, very inappropriate. You should not be contacting members of the board to try to influence their vote. They are there as a jury, essentially, and they will make an independent decision. Obviously, you can review how you think they're doing when it comes time for reappointments, but in, once they're in place, they are an independent body. Planning Commission, same thing. They draft uh, the zoning regulations, make recommendations on certain things. You get to approve the, their decisions. You get to make the final say on the city plan, but you should not be, as a council, interfering with them. I, you can go to a meeting and offer your opinion, but they still have their own say. And the Design Review Committee is part of the Development Review Board of, of process. So just to point out that even though they're under the city government and you're the governing body, they still have their own uh, lay of the land. And this actually comes through with some of our staff. So again, these are appointed by the city manager, but once I make those appointments, so we have an assessor. I cannot tell the assessor what to do with a parcel, whether you know, somebody can apply for tax exempt status. And, Assessor makes an independent judgment based on the statute. They go through a process and and you know lay out the grand list. They set people's appraisals, uh, and then there people can read the appraisal. I, I even though I appoint them, I can't dictate the outcome of their work. Same thing with a fire chief at an emergency scene. You know, once there's an emergency scene, the fire chief is is the person in charge of that scene. Uh, I can show up and I can stand and hand coffee to the firefighters, and that's about it. Um, and uh, same thing with the police. We do not, I have no authority to tell police who to arrest, who to cite, how to do it, when to do it, when to have speed patrols, anything like that. They are in charge of those things. The health officer has very independent authority uh, enacted uh, under the statutes and can take uh, independent action. And in fact, you are also the Board of Health. So there are certain things that could come to the Board of Health for, um, for a health order. And lastly, the zoning administrator. Similarly, even though the zoning administrator is in the planning department and technically works for the planning director, they have complete authority to make independent decisions on their own um, about whether something needs to go to DRB or a permit can be issued and their decisions can be appealed. Um, so it's just important to know that that we have a city government structure, but you know, we're not a corporation where, where everyone can be told what to do and when to do it and how to do it. There are very legal authorities here, so we are managing a large structure to do the work for the public. We also have some independent partners, and I just call them out because they are independent agencies, but we, we certainly you know, work with them. Montpelier Alive for our downtown, the library, 
is a public library, but it's not a city library. We, we have a, we appoint people to their board or one one rep to the board, and obviously they go to the voters for funding. Uh, but other than that, we have no control over them. The school district, of course, is separate. The Green Mountain Transit, uh, Mott League of Cities and Towns, uh, we're a member, uh, and they represent all the cities and towns around the state. I currently serve on the board of directors of that group. Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, again, all parts of the state have regional planning commissions. We're a member of this one, uh, and, and same with the Solid Waste District. Downstreet Housing, um, they don't have any regulatory authority, but they typically are a partner for uh, affordable housing, and we'll work with them to get grants and, and provide units. And then the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System, uh, which we work with with the relative uh, neighboring communities on fire. We were members of Central Vermont Public Safety Authority until yesterday, and we chose to withdraw from it. There were only two members, and they both chose to withdraw, and that is uh, dissolving at this point. Now, I'm just going to, you have this list. I think Mary sent you a link to most of these, and some of you have hard copies. I just say these are key documents. Um, you know, as long as you've read them all by, say, Friday, you'll be good and have them all memorized. I, I just call them out. These are important things that will get referred to from time to time over the course of the year. Um, it's things that you should know that these resources exist, and uh, you can refer to them as needed. Uh, I would really call out the first two, the city charter, um, because that really is is sort of our constitution, and the council handbook, which we've put together over the year, which contains a lot of this stuff and is really meant to be a one place resource with a lot of information, the open meeting laws in there, the public records law, some a lot of our policies are in there, kind of a lot of what I'm telling you right now about process are written down in there, so um, that that is meant to be your book, but um, so key documents. Know they're, know they're out there um, and use them as needed. And and feel free at any time to ask any staff person for the appropriate staff person for the help with them. So with that, any questions about governance or how the board functions and all of that? Roles. Anyone from, I, I, don't, I can't see the screen, so anyone from Zoom land? Perfect. Quiz coming. I mean, we'll do a quiz. So the next thing we're going to talk about roles, and I've divide, divided these up as uh, external authority, sort of vision, and capacity. And I will explain that more on the next slide. But basically, the external authority for you or state and federal governments, um, oh, that should, those should be all one line, uh, our voters, residents, taxpayers, and businesses. And then for staff and me, the mayor and the city council are external authority, uh, because that's who we take our orders from. And then uh, in terms of vision for the city and the organization is really up to the mayor and the council to do that. And then internally, more the, the city manager and staff. And then dealing with capacity to get stuff done, that's really on city manager and staff, volunteers, the people that do the work. And what I mean by that is this. So an organization that functions really well um, lines up these three things. So the and then so the areas in the middle that all three overlap are what you do the best. So my favorite example is snow plowing. I believe that it's the vision of the city council, the leadership that we ought to plow snow here in Vermont. And I believe that the external approving authority residents believe that we should plow snow and support that endeavor. And we, as an organization, have the capacity to plow snow. We have snow plows. We have sidewalk plows. We have sanders. We have people to do it. So they're, they're in the middle. We're all lined up. It's something we all think we should do. It's something we know how to do. People believe we should do it. It's not controversial at all, and we do a pretty good job. Of it. So that is where you're aligned. Where this comes in is now there could be something where you as the council have a vision, but we've got to go to the voters to get approval, and we may or may not have the ability or capacity yet to do it. So. So as we think of these challenges, so who's responsible for these kinds? Where do you fall on these roles? And is as we deal with these problems, uh, you know, or it could be we, there's something we could do, and people want us to do it, but 
the, the leadership doesn't want to do it. They don't have the vision that we should do it. So I think sometimes as we sort through some of these problems, it's good to just take a step and say, is this an authority issue? Like we could do this, we just don't have the approval to do it, or the state doesn't allow us to do it, or gee, we all want to do it. The voters want us to do it. We just don't have the people. We don't know how to do it. We don't have the capacity to do it. So just a kind of a snapshot of how to look at that. So as you go back to um, you go back to this, then you can see. So we're getting just kind of laying out who falls into which category and how we divide up. So break this down a little bit now. So our voters and our residents and our taxpayers. Um, so what do they do? They elect city officials. They vote on budgets and bonds. They engage in local authority and discussion. So they are our, our external authority. They're also owners and customers. And by that, I mean, as owners, they are, they are stakeholders. Every, everyone who's a taxpayer here is a, is a shareholder in the city of Montpelier. So they have a say in policy. They have a say in things. And so they there might be controversy over things. Often there is. You know, what are we going to do? People have disagreement about what we should do. They're also customers. So it may be that... Um, you know, they got a flat tire on a pothole or we plowed something in inappropriately or did something. And so they have a complaint about the service they, they, they received. And those are different things, but those folks are the same people. So, but it, we'll talk about this in a minute. So the mayor and the city council, your role in all of this is you do establish the vision, the policy, the values, and the goals. The biggest things, the, the, the top two policy things that you do are determining how to collect and spend other people's money. Um, you know, all of this is public money. So how we tax, how we set fees, how we set rates, and then what we do with it is the single biggest policy action that you take. Right up there with it is what regulations, zoning ordinances, city plans that you put on. So it's how to, how to tell people how to behave, how to tell people how to use their property. Um, and so that is how you, those are the big issues in how you enact um, policy in the community. Now, obviously there's, it's, things trickle down from those, but that's really at the end of it, it's kind of telling people what to do and how to spend their money. Um, so you think of it like that. You also have fiscal oversight. So you get larger contracts and bids, you get monthly financial reports. You will see, you'll get a copy of the check uh, uh, warrant each week so you can see if you want to go through, you can see every bill we're, we're spending uh, and, and can ask questions. Uh, so, and, and you oversee the city manager. Uh, someone already exhorted you to do that. That's exactly right. That's your job. Is the policy being implemented? Is what you've asked being done? It's getting done on time. Is, is, uh, is that vision being happening? And then going back to the ownership, it's your job really as the, the policy making to address the controversy. When there's controversy in the community over how something's being done, that, that's really a policy map. And so you, as elected officials, kind of have to set a priority. You have to have to make a decision. And then ultimately, the council speaks with one voice. Even though there's seven of you, and even though you may have it out, hammer and nail and tongue, at the end of the day, once the votes are cast, that is, the, that is what the council said. And so the more that we can respect that, even if you were on the the minority side of that particular decision, the more effective the, the city can be and the more effective than the city government can be we know that we're acting on behalf of the elected people. So we go to the city manager. Um, sorry. Oops. Uh, so obviously the city manager's number one job is to implement council's policy. Uh, we, and I, and I say me, it also goes to all the staff. We can also recommend policy to the council, whether that's the budget, whether that's what to do about certain regulations. But at the end of the day, we don't approve that. And if you want to do something different from what we've suggested, that is your prerogative, and we will make happen what you do. We also provide advice and information to the council. Manager is the chief administrative of the officer of the city. What does that mean? That means I hire, fire, supervise all employees, either directly or indirectly, through their departments. We manage all the departments. I and our staff are responsible for the operations of the city. Uh, we provide direct constituent service. A person has a problem, we, we're the people that can help them. And so what, if you're the people addressing controversy, we're the people that address the complaints, the customer service complaints. Now, they may call you, 
because you're their elected rep and that's fine but please and you know it's good to know if we're not getting that done in a timely fashion um, that's part of your oversight role but um but generally if there's something with a water line in front of somebody's house you know, you're you guys aren't going to fix it so we we need to do that so you're in that chain but uh and then finally uh someone had already mentioned the icma code of ethics it is a professional code of ethics for the international city managers association it's printed in your book so i won't read it but um i am a member in fact, i'm also on their uh, board of international board of directors and uh it's my duty to follow that code and lastly as we think about the circles it's the manager and staff's job to provide the capacity um obviously if we recruit funding and those kinds of things uh, but that is our role in the operation so council communications again just a little highlight here all electric electronic communications in your council role are public records so um we do have folks that ask for those and we do have uh you know they can end up in the press so as you think about what you're saying just think about that um if you're communicating with staff again you have no oversight rule over staff so technically you should communicate through the city manager what that means really in practical matters there may be something you don't understand we're gonna we're gonna be doing the city master plan maybe there's a zoning amendment you don't really understand it you may you may just say this to me you mind if i talk to mike miller about this and i'll say no of course not just thanks for letting me know you should know that the staff will tell me about that conversation again i'm not trying to control everything that happens but i don't want to be sitting up here and making a statement and then have someone say well mike miller told me something different so it's really just so we're all consistent we really know what's going on and sometimes and it's not to out anybody for their questions but we think it's best practice if everyone has the same information so if um, a new person keep looking at tim because it's oh, so sal sends an email with a question how does such and such work and we may reply to everybody it's not because we want them to know that Sal asked this question. It's that we're giving him information. We want to make sure you all have that same information. So that, again, he's not at a council meeting saying, well, Bill told me this. And the rest of you are like, I've never heard of this. So, uh, you know, you may occasionally get copied on an email. And that's what it is. It's trying to, to communicate with the public. Uh, Mayor mentioned this earlier today already. But acknowledge receipt of the communication. Clarify whether you're speaking for yourself and not the full council. Because, um, in some cases, you know, we we will adopt who's speaking for the policy. It might be the mayor, or sometimes the mayor didn't agree with it. So the council president might be the person that we designate to do that. When I say by we, I'm actually mean you folks. Um, and then refer the constituent complaints to the, to the manager. Uh, we have no problem if you follow up and say, hey, did you ever take care of uh, Mary Smith's um, problem? And that's fine. You're you're doing your constituent service. Um, but just be clear about your role whenever you're speaking. And obviously, oftentimes people are wanting to tell you their, you know, urge you to vote a certain, take a certain position, or may want to know how you feel about a certain piece of information. And you certainly can say, well, you know, I don't know what the council is all going to do, but I can tell you I'm I'm in favor. I think most of you get that, but it's just important. So any questions about roles? Yeah. Financial. Oversight fees. I just remember my old school board days. But so in the school board, we had a treasurer who reviewed all the disbursements and all the checks, and that was the person who came to the board. So is that what happens here, or is everyone here supposed to look through that? No. So so uh, actually, the board we have you appoint the treasurer. Right. Or is it the treasurer, and she reviews all of that. You approve. You will sign. Usually comes around. You will sign the warrant thing, uh, but we send them all to you by email. Okay. Uh, in advance, some council members look at them really diligently. Others don't. The other thing we'll do is we send out the most. Like, I want to say it's either five thousand or ten thousand. Any checks above a certain amount, we'll flag that just so people can see the really big ones. And as you can, as you might imagine, let's pull over from Scott Construction days of, you know, big check. Mm -hmm. Give someone a chance to say, hey, what's this for? That looks funny. Um, but no, I don't think anyone's expecting you to look at every transaction in detail but okay. it's there if you want to and i think and it's posted out public to see um so um and and you also get the monthly you'll get a monthly financial statement okay so you get a, you'll get a monthly budget update and then quarterly a bigger financial statement and 
usually, and, and those will be on the consent agenda just to acknowledge that we received it and that we had the opportunity to look at it and ask questions if you choose to. Some people choose to raise them in a council meeting. Other people just can come in and say, hey, you know, why are we spending this? So different? You know, it, we've had, you know, you can imagine the range of, of sort of attention to that detail of council members over the years. Uh, people that asked about almost everything to people that probably never looked at. Mm -hmm. But it's there and it is your responsibility or at least as part of your role is to provide oversight. Thanks. Oh, of course. Any other questions? All right. Okay, I still have time. Check it on your time. So we're talking about policy decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so sometimes I, I got this, I stole this from somebody else. But if you think about policy decisions like an airplane ride. So you choose where you want to go. You choose when you, when you want to get there. And you choose how much you're willing to pay. So I want to get somewhere tomorrow. I want to be first class. And I, you know, I'm willing, I want to get nonstop. I'm willing to pay top dollar. Or, well, I want to get there, but I don't mind if I have four stops and I can get the cheap and I'll, you know, take the red eye or whatever. So I think it's, that's a lot of what it is. It's what are we trying to do? What's our goal for when we want to have it accomplished? And how much are we willing to spend? Or, or, or what, if it's a regulatory thing, how much are we willing to impose? So, and what's the outcome we're trying to get from it? And I think that's really where you're at. Continuing with the airline analogy, um, airplane analogy, excuse me. Um, and again, you have this available to you, but it's a good, you, know, you can kind of see that it, this goes from the high level where the city council is really the prime people. What are we trying to do here, folks? What are the, what are the most important things we're dealing with? Okay, what are the goals we're gonna do? What are the action items? And as you see each time, staff's getting a little more involved and then you start, okay, the council's identify these things and then we, the staff would maybe draft up the plan and oversight, bring it to the council adopts and says, yeah, that's what we wanna do. And then they become projects. And then we're really managing the projects. You're maybe getting an update on how they're going, approving major contracts, those kind of things. But at that point, you know, once you've said, we're gonna do East State Street, you're not really, you know, out there doing the engineering on your stage. You've done your part of visioning it, coming up with the money, supporting it. And then the day-to-day -day work is really um, us doing the work and making sure you know what's going on. So I think it's just good to think about that and, and as, you make, as you make policy. And I think that we'll get to that. So currently, and again, this kind of goes back to conversation I think Donna was talking about earlier and I mentioned is that um, some of this was established, you know, a year or two ago. This is the current uh, adopted aspirational vision of the city council from the prior council. So obviously, um, if, if you all would like to, and this usually, this happened during the strategic planning process, so we could do it then if you want to do it at some other time. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's just a statement and then other things fall from that um, as we go into it. And that leads to the mission. Basically, we want to be a leader in the state by providing excellent services that align with community pro pro priorities through proactive communication public. So it's kind of state. We want to be really good at what we do. We want to match up with what the community wants, and we want to make sure we're open and, and communicating about it. Again, that was adopted by the last group. And then lastly, these were the core values the city council adopted. Uh, again, up for change. All of the, these three are all up. You know, for change, but the dignity of worth of all people is recognized. City government will be transparent and accountable. All city activities will be conducted in a highly ethical manner. Innovation is encouraged and rewarded. Diversity, equity, and inclusion in the organization are essential. Climate change is real and proper pre pre preparation must be made. City will be financially responsible with public money. City employees are respected, treated fairly, recognized for their commitment to the community. Those are the core values. So if you, you, this group wants to revisit that, that's certainly well within your policy purview. Then the current strategic plan sets major goals, improve community prosperity, provide responsible and engaged government, create more housing, practice good environmental stewardship, build and maintain sustainable infrastructure, and improve public health and safety. And then under that are a list of you know, specific initiatives, projects, they get more specific as you go down. Urge you all to look at the strategic plan. It's available online. You have access to it. Uh, and again, you will get a chance to weigh in on this. 
Uh, last year, we just did kind of a tweak update to it. Oops. Um, but I, I would think this year with such a big change in the council, we're gonna to wanna to do a deep dive uh, to make sure. And, and in fact, on the next agenda, uh, we tentatively scan, plan to go over this to see if th this particular strategic plan still resonated with the, this group or whether we wanted to get into that sooner rather than later. Um, and that does, and I mentioned this only because that drives kind of what shows up on the agendas and it drives how we make decisions, you know, I can be a better manager for you if I know what your priorities are. If something comes up and I can say, yes, let's do that because I know that's a council priority. You know, I don't have to wait two weeks, to get it on the agenda, see if that's what you want. So clarity is kind in that case. So the, sooner, the more we have to work with what the council speaking with one voice, then the better we can do our jobs. Again, as per the last outgoing council, the top issues that we really want to focus on infrastructure, housing, homelessness, and net zero sustainability. Um, so that's, you know, we talk a lot about that. And again, a lot of it came up during the election. And uh, again, that can always be reiterated. So when we do the strategic planning, either an update or a full review, recently we've been doing it in September and October uh, because it's right in advance of budget. And so we make decisions, set priorities, talk about what's important to us and then have to put the money where the mouth is when but and it's still fresh in our minds before that which we started i think a couple of years ago we used to do it right about now well march or april right after the new council got elected what what do we want to do for the year part of the problem is you don't have the funding to do it until the next march so in some cases so it's it always felt like a bit of a lag but um, it's really, it's your plan, so we can do it whenever you want. It's it's often facilitated with an outside facilitator, not always. Uh, and it's an iterative process between council and staff, you uh, you talking about your vision, what's important, what your priorities are, what your goals and staff, you know, and sometimes staff has particular projects they want to get done that meet those goals, but you might not know about them. So it's a chance to hear about those and also um, maybe be get a reality check about what can and can't be done or what the time, or what a reasonable time frame is. So we try to, and then it establishes uh, the goals, initiatives, actions, steps, and is adopted by the council. So it is the council's plan. Uh, it's not staff's plan, it's not the city manager's plan, it's the council's plan. And then what we do is we take that plan and we lay out really council agendas for the whole year, for the next six months at least. This this needs to come back, this, project, this report is due, they're gonna want an update on this activity. And you also get uh, quarterly reports on how they, and, and they're online for anybody to see. Um, we have a software for this uh, where you can see the status of all these activities. So to the extent that you are holding us accountable, we try to provide that information for you and the quarterly um, reports are issued. And it all really comes down, oh, so the, the budget process. So this follows that. So once we've set the priorities and strategic plan, obviously the goal is that, um, the budget matches your priorities. That's what we're trying, we and staff is trying to accomplish. That could be any, so it could be certain things you want to get done. It could be certain financial priorities. We don't want the tax rate to go. We want it to go the inflation or whatever targets you set. That That is a policy goal as well. Um, and then there's also, so we want to accomplish all these things, but we want to do it within these fiscal complaints. It's back to the plane, right? How much do we want to pay to get to where we want to get when we want to get? So we usually start in October with some preliminary budget uh, projections where, uh, you know, they're very rough, very conservative, but you kind of get a worst case scenario of, of, of what it might look like. And then we ask you for any, any guidance that you want to give us. Uh, what's important, what isn't, what do you want to do? Some years we get very specific guidance, other years we get, we'll wait and see. Uh, so it, it's really up to you how you choose to do that. We then prepare the budget in November. You'll hear this term, so I just threw it out there. We call it Budget Congress. We changed, a few years ago, we changed the way we did the budget. We used to always do it the old-fashioned way where everybody submitted their budget to the city manager. We sat down and worked through it. And then the department heads would complain about why they got cut and somebody else didn't get cut. So one year we said, well, let's do it together. So now we all get in a room and uh, we do the budget as a group and we make group decisions. And um, it's it's... A beautiful thing to see it's not it's not easy but um we when we leave and you can ask any of the department heads about their opinion and i you know I, I hope they give you an honest answer whether they agree with me or not but people really understand what other 
department's needs are and why certain decisions are made. And they will often, we've had people say, hey, I, I can't ask for this because I, I think you need that more. Uh, so when it comes to you, it really is a, a result of that group process. You get that budget in December, then you hold your hearings in December and January. And again, those can really be uh, as much as many or as few and to what set of detail and review that you want. It's, a, you know, it's a, in the end of the day, you're approving the ballot budget for going on the ballot in January. So it's got to be the process has to be what you want to make you feel comfortable that um, you're you're comfortable putting the council's name on it to, for vote. And then the residents vote on the budget the first Tuesday of March and then the budget begins July 1st. So that's how the strategic planning leads into the budget process, either immediately or with a few months lag. But that's still linked. And it all leads to the big question. How do you want to use your 100 hours? And I say that because if you look at the roughly two meetings a month, three or four hours meeting, you know, there's a few more, it comes to about 100 hours a year, more or less, that you as a group are sitting in this room or a room making policy decisions. That's two and a half work weeks in a whole year that you have to deal with all of these problems. So part of this is to help you sort out what are the most important things on your table that you're using your time efficiently every two weeks, sitting here till 9 30, 10 o'clock, and being criticized and getting suggestions from people and trying to make decisions about very important issues and getting yourself informed. So that's what the strategic plan is really for, is putting a lot of upfront time to say these are the most important things that we want to we want to put our time in and that when it comes to the budget, how can we most effectively use our budget deliberation to see if it's getting us where we want to be. So there's no good answer to this, but it's really, it's the open-ended question for you. So any questions about policy? Okay. Jack, I just want to note, Peter Kelman has his hand up. I don't know if you want to take public questions now or. Yeah, we can take a comment from him or question. Peter, go ahead. <laughs> Jack, you knew I was going to make a comment and not ask a question, right? Uh, I, uh, I, I I love this presentation. Uh, I, I actually, I've heard this before. This and I think that what Bill's describing works ninety five percent of the time, maybe ninety eight. I don't know, but I do have two concerns. One is what happens when something has been a policy and goes through all the the steps, including it's funded and so forth, and then something goes wrong. The Guertin Park structure, can, uh, potholes, something goes wrong, and it doesn't come back to the city council. It's handled administratively. So you made all those decisions, but but I think we need to have a, a way of um, having the city manager come back and say, you know what? This can thing, uh, it's not working. Uh, here's what we recommend. That didn't happen. Not that I, I, don't, I don't think. Um, and I, I think it's kind of important because it's 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 harder to see things that don't happen um, that haven't happened if you don't if if you, it's not drawn to your attention. You only have the hundred hours. The second thing I want to say is that I love the core values. But I really think you've got to be constantly asking yourself, are we walking the walk? Or are we just talking the talk? And again, 95%, I'll say, I'd say, yes, you are walking the walk. But what about that other 5%? And I would urge you to keep your eye on that. We've had a number of very uh, difficult issues that have come up. Uh, the um, prostitution discussion, the open carry of alcohol discussion, the uh, uh, homeless people in the uh, parks discussion. And in some of those discussions, I think that we've, we, we, we've gotten, we, we, we've been kind of sloppy. I'll, I'll, I'm going to end in a minute, Donna. We've, get, we've gotten, we, forget, we aren't looking at walking the walk. Okay. So those are the two things, walking the walk. And what about that, those times when things that the city council said they wanted to do. It didn't work. Bring it back. Thanks. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, okay, well, this was, yeah, well, that's fine. Very briefly, please, yeah. yeah. Very brief. Uh, I'd ask you to look at the state statutes for the Department of Finance. Uh, former Senator Polina got an amendment put in there that requires engaging with the public, having a meaningful public process in budget development. What you're doing is this, there's a built-in inertia here. We're working off of last year's budget and priorities. And by the time it gets to the public, it's just, yeah, we'll listen to you for two minutes and then we're going to do what we're going to do anyway. That's not the way we should be doing this. We need to, you need to be hearing from the public as we develop the budget and prioritize and elevate certain things and push other things down because that we're paying for it. Um, and I think Peter was being uh, real generous with 95-5. I think it's more like 60-40, whether we're walking the talk or, or going through the motions. Thank you. So as I said earlier, um... The budget process is up to the council to decide how they want to do it, and it could be as expansive or, or restrictive. Uh, I appreciate the state government process. Our our process is set in statute and in the charter for local governments, and we follow it. Um, but this is really intended to just orient you to issues that are coming. So what you heard is a couple of comments that are controversies about policy and are things that will fall into your lap. Um, I would say that to respond to the comment from Mr. Kalman, uh, typically, if there is a problem, we either put it in the weekly report that something's not going well, it shows up in the uh, strategic plan report. If something's delayed, we, we call that out in every quarter. We report to you how we're doing on priorities and things that are stalled. Show or it's, it's a very tricky system that we have. It's either red, yellow, or blue, or, or uh, green. So you figure out if things are moving along, it's green. If it's slower than expected it's yellow and if it's held up for some reason or stalled then it's red and we call those out for all of you to see uh in particular situations like can um i actually reported that at a council under my manager report at a council meeting saying here's what we intend to do and the council nodded their head so absolutely um need to report out on things uh speak with the mayor weekly and sometimes we'll you know i'll usually ask is this something you think should go to the council that is one of the mayor's role is sort of gatekeeping. And uh, so, yes, absolutely. Uh, there's no intent to hide anything that we do or don't do. Uh, but moving on. So now we're going to move into. Uh, so if you'd like to take a break, this might this be, be the time to do it because everyone here is going to give a, um, a hopefully a five minute or less presentation about their department. Lauren. I just wanted to note, Linda Berger has her hand up online. Oh. I know you can't see it. Let's so take, if we wanted to take well, her. We can take, take it. Yeah. Linda, go ahead. Thank you. I just, I just have an observation. I've been um, attending a lot of school board meetings and it's, it's more visible that that board has an oversight role than what I, what I observe or or my impression from watching the city council. And I, I, I don't know if that has to do with different open meeting laws or understanding of open meeting laws, but it's just, as an observer, it's just been interesting, that's all. Okay, thank you. I, I can respond to that very briefly, Linda. Um, they, they have the same open meeting law that we have, uh, and we have a veteran in the school department. Um, but there are some differences in statutes and the way things operate. For example, uh, the school board actually hires employees. So they approve contracts for employees. They make final decisions on principles and those kind of things. Uh, that's not the case under a city manager form of government. So that's just an example where they're actually much more involved in specific things. They handle cases of student discipline sometimes. Um, they, so, and, and, they're, and they have a huge, don't get me wrong, I mean, I, God bless them, everyone's kids, and uh, they have a huge responsibility, but they are a single operation entity. They they do schools. They're not, whereas the city, we're doing police, fire, public works, planning, zoning. We are sort of a much wider range of things than the schools. So therefore, I think the council needs to set priorities amongst all of those things and and where they to spend their time sort of running each of those departments, we'd be meeting daily, uh, not not twice a month. So I think I think those are very fundamental differences. And and as I said, the laws for school boards are are different than the laws for cities. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Break time. 
break time. Ten minutes, so we'll come back here at uh, eight uh, twenty-seven or something like that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, this next part is uh, about our operations departments and facilities. I've got a couple of small comments before we start in um, with our our team. First of all, iceberg. Anyone have an idea why we have an iceberg up here? <laughs> so the basically the point of this is that the stuff that gets talked about in this room and the policy things are kind of the top of the iceberg, right? That's the stuff that people see that that's visible that requires public everything below is like the work we do. So I think it's easy to remember that there are policy decisions, there are, you know, all the important things we're wrestling with, what to do with housing, but we're also plowing roads, answering police calls, answering ambulance calls, providing services to seniors. We're doing all the, the daily work of city government. And that that's really what falls under the staff and the city manager's purview. And so what we want to do today is kind of just walk you through a little bit of, give you a sense of what's really happening in this organization of the city that you're sort of the board of directors, the city council for that, that is all falls under your oversight. Um, so I'm not going to read all these, but just this is a list of city facilities. Um, so you can have this, but you can look through. There's a, there's a lot of them for a small little city. Um, and uh, again, you can have this. So uh, just important to know that all of these are things that we maintain, take care of, uh, that you're responsible, that we have to you know budget for, all those kind of things. So these are all things that are happening. And then we have our city operations, which we're going to talk about public safety. Anyway, uh, public safety is, you know, basically our police, fire, community justice center, public works, water, sewer, all of this. Community, you know, again, they're going to go through all these, but these are the basic areas of city operations that we're providing. And you're going to hear from everybody in detail, I think, except the city clerk, but I'm sure he'd be happy to freestyle if you need to. Um, so here's our organizational chart. Uh, as you can see, the voters elect you, they elect the city clerk, you then appoint various committees and the manager, and then you can see how each department lays out. Uh, this is in the budget, this is online. Again, it's in your book, but just gives you a sense of the operation and the organization uh, that you'll be hearing about. And so we'll start with the city manager's office. You know me, uh, Kelly, if you haven't met Kelly Murphy. Um, she is our assistant city manager and handles a lot of the day-to-day -day detail. Uh, this is an opportunity. I'm not going to spend much time on our office because we already talked a lot about what we do. I will note that we do have a communications person. We have Mary. We provide admin support to the city council. So to the extent that you need it or, you know, we're responding to people on your behalf. Uh, so Mary Smith, you will hear from a lot. Evelyn Prim is our communications person. And right now, Chris Lumber, our sustainability coordinator, is in our working out of our office as well. Um, so we'll leave it at that. So. Uh, each department head is going to do a very quick pit stop through their department, and you are welcome. I think we've, we've thought, you know, if you have a question for that particular department, and feel free to ask it then. You don't have to wait till the end, till everyone's gone, so you don't forget. So we are going to start with the new kid on the block, our uh, latest person, uh, our finance director, Sarah LaCroix. That made her go first as a guinea pig. Hi, my name is Sarah LaCroix. I'm a certified public accountant and I'm the new finance director for the city. Uh, here's our org chart. The finance department is made up of um, eight employees, including the human resources director, who you'll hear from after me. Uh, I've provided a brief synopsis of the mission, um, but the mission of the finance department is to ensure that all resources of the city of Montpelier are managed and accounted for in an effective and efficient manner, that all financial records are presented in a timely, accurate, and meaningful format, and that all staff members work towards continuous improvement in professional service. We oversee the city's financial matters and maintain the accounting records for the 24 active funds. Um, and responsibilities include, but are not limited to, budget preparation, compliance, billing services, accounts payable, and payroll processing. Sarah, um, before you move on, could could you say what it means to say we have active funds? What is a fund in that terminology? Um, so like the general fund and the water and sewer fund, there are other funds that the city has that account um, for the accounting operation. So that's, that's what the funds are. We have 24 of them that are reported on in the audit report. 
that thank you helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as key issues go i felt it was important to note two financial policies these are the fund balance policy and the debt management policy i've again summarized some key important pieces um, as they relate uh, especially to the percentages that have been adopted for the minimum unassigned fund balance and then the debt ratios. I also will provide monthly updates um, of budget actuals to the city council and that is on next meeting. There will be another budget actual report. Um, but um, congratulations to everybody who's new on the council and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Sarah? I, you may recall we've talked about Tanya recently during, I think during my review because uh, she's one of the department heads. You almost never is at a council meeting because she's doing all of her work internally. So happy to give her a chance to show off for you. So I would like to congratulate all of you and thank you all for your willingness to serve the community. My name is Tanya Chambers and I'm the Human Resources Director. A large part of my role is focused primarily on employees, which is why you don't see me here. Um, I work hard to build valuable relationships with them in an effort to help them express their needs and concerns. An organization's workplace culture has been one of the top priorities among younger job seekers, making sure that we as an employer can provide a positive work environment that includes coaching, mentoring, and internal promotions as well as trust and leadership and an empathetic approach are among my priorities. Another important role of mine is to manage the employee compensation and benefits package. As indicated in my slide, work and life balance is one of the ways that the city has taken a more flexible approach with staff by allowing flexible hours, consideration to four 10-hour days, and remote working whenever possible. It is an ongoing effort to strategize new ways to keep the cost of health insurance down, which is also an annual task that I share with other employees here at the city. And lastly, prioritizing employee engagement. As highlighted in my slide, the quote reads, engagement equals increased morale and increased morale equals engagement. From the point of onboarding to recognition of an employee's hard work, investing in our employees in all ways possible is crucial to the success of the city. Questions for Tanya, but on the HR philosophy, we don't get many shots at hers. <laughs> <laughs> Take it while you can. Although you will, the new folks, you will be meeting with Tanya to fill out your W-2s because you do get paid. Yes, there is pre-employment paperwork <laughs> that must happen. I, I would ask, well, like, what are your top two, what do you find the top two issues with employees? So I would say um, before the, the generous increase in the budget to allow for um, higher wages, I would have said that finding employees um, who actually want to apply to the city um, for the amount that we can pay them would have been one of the top. Um, and to find the right people for the right seat, which is taking that right from you, but um, that that is also uh, one of the top priorities. And then also, I would say making sure that we can provide them with uh, the benefits that they would seek at a cost that we can afford. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, so Carol from the community, Carol from the Community Justice Center, I think is appearing remotely. Is that right, Carol? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'll start off by just saying, uh, giving you a list of what our programs are. So we are grant funded by the Department of Corrections, and our programs are, we have restorative justice panels, we do a restorative outreach program for people who've been affected by crime, circles of support and accountability, which is part of our offender reentry program. We do transitional housing. We have a conflict assistance program, um, which is basically mediation and facilitation, helping pro people um, resolve their disputes. And that includes in-house consultation and referrals. So um, we also have services for other departments within the city with the conflict assistance program. We do our own volunteer recruitment and training. Um, we do community education and community forums. And we have two classes that we run. One is called Parenting with Respect, and that's for men whose children are DCF involved. And then 
uh, Alfred co-facilitates um, a revisions program, which is a domestic violence awareness program. So uh, there are four of us on staff, and you can see the breakdown of, um, of the staff. And like I said, we get our funding from the Department of Corrections, so we're a net neutral department. And uh, we do get a lot of in-kind support. The city supports us by providing our offices for us, all of the fiscal management of our budgets and, and uh, that sort of thing, which we're incredibly grateful for. Um, so the current projects that I'm working on, um, in addition to the city having you know, priority around equity and inclusion, um, we've been asked by the Department of Corrections through one of our grants to include diversity, equity, and inclusion um, efforts in what we're doing, and they gave us some funding to, to do that. So we are hiring a consultant who's going to work with us to help increase both staff and volunteer awareness of implicit bias uh, in our beliefs, attitudes, policies, and practices. So that's underway. We're going to be creating a plan to conduct a, a more formal equity audit that we are using the information that we got from creative discourse when that effort happened for the city. And then we're going to expand on that so that we can continue to increase the diversity in our volunteer recruitment, um, which is important for the people that are coming into our programs. Um, so we're utilizing that one-time funding that's coming this year. Um, we, I follow the legislation and all of the justice centers around the state follow the legislation that's happening because there are some uh, priorities right now that may affect our funding and our caseloads. I won't go into any of that. It's pretty involved. Um, we provide information to the legislators about what's relevant to us and what our needs are. Um, we've been level funded for the past 10 years or so, which means that we're basically losing money every year. We're doing uh, more with less every year. So we're focused on seeking maintenance of the 23 uh, fiscal year 23 funding right now, and then building in um, some uh, the COLA because we don't have that automatically. And that's really important. Again, as Tanya was talking about retention and recruiting for staff and having the right staff. Um, it's really important to be able to provide that. Um, so, and, and one of the things that's happening right now is the legislature is talking about an exception to the pro prohibition of uh, domestic violence and sexual violence cases coming to the restorative justice centers. So if that happens, it won't be an immediate change where we'll just start getting um, a huge caseload of those types of cases, but there will be work to do, and that is a really new priority. Um, right now, I'm in the process of seeking accreditation for our parenting class, and if we get that accreditation, we'll be able, eligible for some funding to be able to make that program more sustainable and uh, train more people around the state to be able to deliver that really important uh, educational program for men. And um, that is coming up at the end of the of the month, so really busy and uh, doing good good work sorry i didn't mean to give you the run out there any questions no worries. For thank you carol okay next is the fire and ems department chief gowans yes good evening thank you i'm chief gowans robert gowans fire chief this is um my 13th year as the chief of the department um 44. <laughs> so I have till the 44 years with the department, 13 is chief. Um, this is our family tree. As you see, uh, we have 17 employees. Currently, we're at 16. We had a, an employee retire, and we're in the process of filling that. Uh, we had we start, we had 18 uh, applicants for the position. We're down to seven, and we're going to be conducting interviews this week and uh, anticipate making an offer next week for a 17th employee. Of those 17, I want to point out that we have five paramedics on staff now, which is which is really good. Yeah, we're, we're really growing our paramedic program. So some uh, ongoing uh, challenges that we always have, um, and, and a lot of it's just replacing equipment, keeping up with equipment. Equipment is very expensive. Um, communications equipment, I'm happy to announce, though, that just yesterday we received word that we re uh, have gotten a grant from Vermont Emergency Management, um, close to $100,000 grant, and we'll be replacing all of our portable radios. 
which is a it's um, it's needed. It's all part of um, the, the uh, ongoing communications project. This is one piece of it that needed to happen, and, and we were able to get a grant to secure that. Um, air packs, the packs we wear into fires, things like that. Um, unfortunately, all those things have a shelf life, and um, whether you wear an air pack into a fire five times a day or five times a year, it doesn't matter. They 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 life out. So, hose, small tools, paramedic and EMS equipment supplies, all 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 those things um, are you know quite costly. And then finally, the tower truck. You know, this council will be hearing more about the tower truck. It's uh, it's going on thirty years old. Uh, it's it's pictured there, and it's it's time that we start thinking about replacing. And and then finally, uh, staffing and staff training is is always a big challenge for us. Our staff um, forms two functions: they're firefighters and they're either EMTs or paramedics. So they so that the training that goes into that is um, takes a lot of time, a lot of time. Between um, so all, all of our staff are either trained at the firefighter two or fire officer two level. That's the highest level of training that's offered, and they're either um, advanced EMTs or paramedics. So the ongoing annual training involved in that it, it takes quite a bit of time. So um, so that's all I have. Um, but I'll just leave with um, please reach out to me. Come to the fire station. Um, Take a visit, sit down. We can talk about a lot of different options. Look around. Um, feel free to spend an evening, a day. Um, go out on calls with us. Um, I always think about um, former Mayor Watson. She spent three consecutive nights with us, and nothing happened. And on her third night, uh, ten minutes after she left, we went out to a pretty significant fire. So, <laughs> so, so please reach out and uh, come visit with us. Um, stay with us. Respond on calls with us. We'd love to have you. Any questions for the chief? Also the plastic hats too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Speaking of chiefs, Chief Nordson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like I need the former mayor of Watson in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Nordenson. Now, uh, obviously, with the police departments, um, it's kind of mirror uh, Chief Gowans. I have three months experience as the chief, so not quite as much as he has, but I'll do the best I can uh, with you folks. Uh, our primary responsibility at the police department is to provide for the safety and security of our. Excuse me. Uh, could we have that conversation be out of the room, please? Sorry about that. Uh, our primary focus is to provide for the safety and security of our residents and our visitors. Um, our organizational chart is uh, pretty straightforward. It has a chief, a deputy chief, uh, sergeants who are our frontline supervisors, uh, corporals who are our secondary supervisors, and also kind of a, the, the in-between uh, and mentor program. And then we have just our, our regular uh, police officers who provide the day-to-day -day service. We're authorized for 17 police officers, and we're currently at 16. Typically, our 17th officer was either at the schools or in a task force, and we're not in a position right now to put somebody in one of those things, so we're going to hold tight at 16 officers for right now. Um, we also do have a public safety support uh, service administrator who does all our ambulance billing and our, our individual billing with just uh, the police department and the fire department, so we share that position with both of them. Um, I'm also responsible for the dispatch center, um, so as you can see, it it goes from me to a deputy chief that we're, we're looking to promote at some point here. Uh, we have a dispatch supervisor, uh, seven regular dispatchers, uh, two part-time dispatchers who work on a per diem basis. It's a, a real nice benefit. They've been full-time certified dispatchers, have other jobs, but can fill in when we need to. So a real nice thing there. Um, so we are fully staffed at the dispatch center, which is, which is a real nice thing there too. Uh, the last part is the community service officers, parking enforcement. Uh, sorry about the picture. The time expired. I tried to find a, a better picture, but that was the best I had. Uh, so so for that one, I, I, again, uh, I'm at the top. We have a full a full time uh, community service officer, one uh, like 6.625 and then another couple part time ones uh, that do maintenance and then winter band for DPW. Uh, some of our key challenges, uh, when we started talking about this uh, back in December, 
staffing. I was at 11 uh, full-time police officers. You folks and the folks before you were very generous with, uh, with the wage adjustments uh, and our culture helped us attract some significant uh, help. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm amazed to say that we're at 16. Uh, three of those are at the full-time police academy though. So uh, I like to say I'm full, but I, I still have three that are, are training. Um, so staffing is still somewhat of an issue until we can get those three up to speed. The reports at the police academy are they they are doing very well and i'm hoping by the end of the summer that they'll be ready for what we call independent patrol so we can send them out out on their own to make decisions um with with that said my other challenge is training um i think we find that we have a lot of new people um so the training part to get them into our culture and get the experience that we need is uh, i'll be coming to you for money for training um, and I think the standards are really high in this community. So training is something that you guys have always supported, which I appreciate. Um, and we also have to plan for the long-term future of the police department because I'm getting older. The top of our department is also getting older and we have to plan for the next wave of that uh, development. So that is all in the works for us and it requires a significant investment in training. What else? Oh, that's Any that's questions it. for Chief? Not a question. I just think it's great that you've been able to hire up, uh, get it, get away from the really tough times you're having uh, last year or two. Thank you. Lauren. Yeah, totally agree. This is exciting to see where you are now. Um, what's the status with um, the, I forget the name of it, but like the community engagement officer, the, um, what, officer. Uh, what um, officer Philbrick was. Yep. So, so he is still in that role and we're fill, you know, he's still on patrol, obviously. Um, we still do daily walk, no, weekly walks with Montpelier Live. Uh, he does a lot of our community engagement, uh, the majority of our social media posts. Um, we're starting to get a little bit more interactive with our web page. So you'll see more data. I know data is, data, everybody wants data. Um, our Facebook page, I don't like how we kind of just spit out the data. It'll be much cleaner on the web page. Um, it's just tricky to do on social media. Um, but as soon as we have staffing, he can dedicate more of that time to that. Did I survive? <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> Good evening. I am Patrick Healy from Greenmount Cemetery. Okay, employees. Um, it's myself full time. Actually, I've gone to part time. I semi retired in December after 35 years, and I've gone to 0. 0.6. Um, and then we have a sec uh, cemetery technician, uh, Carl Griffith. Uh, and then we have a work crew from uh, the Department of Corrections, six to eight offenders, five days a week, approximately nine o'clock in the morning to about two o'clock in the afternoon. Governance uh, the big thing we want you to know is that we are not under bill. Um, we're not under you. I'm under five publicly elected commissioners, but it's a fine line. And, and the way they set this up way back in 1854 is they wanted the money to stay separate from the town fathers. Back then, they were all fathers. Um, and um, so that's that's where we are. And but we're working closer together and we're so far, we're playing pretty well in the, in the sandbox. Go ahead. Uh, so what are we doing for services? The big service right now is natural burials. Um, we do vault burials and we'll do cremation burials. We have mausoleum lots. Um, what our current needs are, we're looking for additional land. Uh, we need renovation monies for the chapel vault building down front. And that's probably going to be between one and two million. And if you have any questions or somebody that you know that has questions, they can call me anytime on my cell. I uh, 0227969957 and please come down for a visit or if you have a group of people that want to visit our tour we'll, we'll be glad to show you around. Patrick. Yes. Patrick when you talk about additional land are you talking about expanding the acreage you have now or are you looking to find another site? Well we we um economically it would be nice to expand what we have. And we probably will be talking to the adjoining landowner once again, and hopefully we can work something out. Okay, thanks. Right. Thank you. I just want to thank you for the lack of mowing at the different seasons. It's been a beautiful place to walk in. 
year round. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, less well, mowing is better. Uh, less mowing is, and and we're we're adapting to you know less fossil fuels, um, less poll pollinator habitat, and less health. When when COVID started, um, we didn't have any crew coming from work crew, work, the work camp. Um, and keep in mind that our our cemetery was designed in 1852 when there were no lawnmowers. For a hundred years, there were mechanical lawnmowers on that property. And that's, mm. we're trying to go back to that. And it mm. seems to be working. So, thank you. Next up is Planning Director Mike Miller. All right, good evening. And uh, as Bill said, I'm Mike Miller. I've been the Planning Director for the city uh, since 2014 and been planning for about 20, almost 25 years now. So within uh, within the city here, uh, I actually oversee two departments, um, planning and community development, which is 3.8 folks. Um, the part-time person is Meredith Crendel, who's a zoning administrator. She actually only works four days a week, um, but we also have the community development specialist and the planning and zoning assistant. Uh, Fire Chief uh, Bob Gowans and myself share the oversight responsibilities of the building inspector. That just has to do with the fact that um, in fire situations and a number of other situations, she's responding with the fire chief. So, so what do we do? Uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, we develop plans and we help implement those plans through programs, projects, and regulations. Um, so a lot of times people think of us just as doing planning and zoning. We write regulations and we enforce regulations, but we actually look much broader than that. Um, you know, we're, we're, as we're developing plans, we're looking at all the options for how to implement them, um, including uh, how do we create programs or projects like Country Club Road. Our biggest effort in this area is the update to the city plan right now, which will be coming to public comment this summer and uh, hopefully we'll be able to participate this summer and this fall as that moves forward. And that's really the city's overarching plan for the next eight to 10 years. And probably to nobody's uh, surprise, our biggest challenge is housing. Um, our office is responsible for trying to go and identify ways to encourage uh, and assist in the development of new housing and in particular affordable housing. Uh, the Country Club Road is our biggest project effort in this area, and we anticipate a plan that includes both housing and recreational opportunities to be um, built in the coming years. Currently, we're working on the currently we're working on the 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 plan itself. Um, we're breaking this into a couple of pieces. Uh, the plan, prepare, implement. We're doing the planning step right now, and that's what uh, Josh and the folks at White and Burke are. Spearheading is the development of those plans. And then, you know, in uh, getting back to Bill's analogy of the airplane landing, right now, a lot of these decisions are going to be in the public's hands and in your hands. And as this moves forward to the preparation steps and the implementation steps, more of it will move into our department and other departments to move forward on uh, making zoning changes and making other programmatic changes so we can get that project successfully completed um, in, a, in hopefully a relatively short time period. That's our goal. Any questions for Mike? Just, just as an aside, actually tentatively scheduled for your next meeting in two weeks is going to be the sharing of the, the first draft of plans that uh, based on the public comment. So we, they wanted to do it tonight, and I was like, we're not making them do it on the first meeting. So. <laughs> That's right. Okay, Kurt. Oh, Kurt's not here. That's right. We have capable uh, assistant. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zachary Blodgett, and I'm the deputy director for the Department of Public Works. Uh, on the left, you'll see Kurt Monica. Uh, what up? Um, there, you, there you go. There's Kurt. He's out west uh, looking at some equipment for uh, the, the sewer plant. Uh, here's our organizational chart for our streets, fleet, and city hall maintenance. Uh, that also includes engineering and admin. We have uh, 12 and a half positions in the streets uh, side of things. We have uh, six total on engineering and admin with one vacancy current. Uh, and then you'll also see we have one tech person. Uh, and in addition, we have 
four people within our fleet or equipment division. On the left hand side, you'll see a breakdown of our water operations. Uh, I'm responsible for the 7 individuals in the water uh, distribution and Kurt is responsible for uh, the 3 at the, the plant um, on the right hand side. You'll see uh, a breakdown of our sewer um, mm -hmm. and we have 7. The same seven on the sewer side of things and four plant operators and then ultimately Kerr oversees uh, really all divisions uh, within the department. Uh, our biggest challenge uh, across the board is infrastructure, 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 infrastructure. Uh, the first one that you'll see is on the water side. Uh, that's a picture of a pipe that was cut out in the last five years. Um, you'll see uh, how much uh, tuberculation is on the inside of the pipe. Uh, we just we have a lot of aging infrastructure that we need to replace. Uh, the next slide over, you'll see just a street uh, with a, a poor pavement condition um, where the challenge here is funding and keeping the funding at a steady level to maintain the PCI. In addition to uh, PCI and pavement, we also have a few other items on the street side of things, such as trash collection, uh, and lighting uh, that needs upgrades. And could you remind us what PCI means? PCI is Pavement Condition Index, and it's an evaluation between zero and 100 as an indicator of how good your road condition is. Uh, the the target for that city council has set is a 70 for uh, the city of Montpelier. Uh, on the stormwater side, uh, the next picture over, you'll see this is a picture of a pipe on, on Granite Street. Um, this is a fairly unfortunate uh, typical picture uh, or type of pipe that we have. You'll see the whole bottom is completely deteriorated. One of the reasons why we're looking at um, and pursuing a stormwater utility. In addition, we have water quality and permitting issues. And then lastly, you'll see on the right, on the far right, you'll see a picture of a, a sewer pipe. Um, again, aging infrastructure, there's a lot of needs for replacement. In addition to aging pipes, we have combined sewer overflows, which is uh, stands for CSO. Um, and that means basically when we have heavy rains, uh, the sewer system gets overwhelmed and we discharge um, some of that waste to the, the rivers. Um, so we have a couple projects that are going to be going on this year. Uh, one big project starting in the next uh, two months or so on State Street and then then the big East State Street project. Um, in addition to CSOs, we have the, the plan upgrades in PFOS. Uh, PFOS, I'm not going to try to explain what that is other than it is a forever chemical um, and that's actually why Kurt is not here he's looking at some equipment that will reduce the levels to undetectable limits uh, not completely get rid of but um, reduce them to uh, levels that are tolerable okay thanks can I, can I ask you just a real practical question why do we get potholes and uh, I complained about one specific one uh, the interstate at the intersection of River Street and where the credit union is in the high school. And you said, go out and take a picture. Well, it got filled. Well, I went by today <laughs> and there's another one. Yeah. So potholes are what one, they happen when you have really poor payment. Condition, say right? to the mic. Yeah. So potholes occur when you have really poor payment condition, but it's also a process of your freeze and thaw. So as the water gets into the cracks in the pavement, that the freeze and thaw action starts popping and unraveling pavement, which is why your best management practices are to crack seal pavement, preserve it, prevent the water from actually penetrating down into the pavement so that you don't start that uh, popping and, and unraveling uh, that you get. So why don't we do, why don't we do more of that? Uh, well, there, it's always, we have a lot of competing needs, right? So in the winter, we are spending a lot of time, uh, snow uh doing plowing uh winter maintenance meaning like we have to remove snow from the, the park stalls um and there's also we have a product called cold patch which is expensive um but tends to not work well uh some of the other options that we have are we have an asphalt recycler which we can make um an asphalt product over the winter uh but it is still, it takes a lot of time and it's a slow process. So if we kind of do it in between storms as we, as time allows, but we also, you know, first and foremost, we have to clear the roads and make sure that it's safe for, you know, the public and uh, vehicles and pedestrians. 
I appreciate that. You've answered it many times for me, but I wanted other people to hear it. Thank okay. you. Okay. What was GPW question? Sure, we'll have plenty of time to talk with them. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Zach. Well, snow removal. Ooh. Recreation department. Since the guy gets to play, it's all about fun. <laughs> Hi, I'm Arnie McMullen. I'm the director of recreation. Um, we have a few full-time folks, a total of five, and we also have many seasonal staff that we rely on in order to pull off all of our activities that we do throughout the summer. And we're also, for many folks, many of these young folks, we are a probably a first employer for a lot of these a lot of these kids that come out and work for the pool or even work at day camp. So it's a first time opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so the Montpelier Recreation Department offers a wide range. Uh, these are our key issues, wide range of programs for all ages of the community from preschool through seniors. Um, we have program offerings. We offer sports programs, gym programs, after school programs, summer camp, swim, uh, swim lessons, tennis, pickleball, lessons and more as well as special events for the community. We also have two licensed child care programs. We have our after school program that's licensed and we also have our summer day camp that's licensed, which allows us to accept state subsidy for folks who can't afford to um, pay for their program. Um, but with events such as the ski and skate sale, we're bringing back on this year, the, the chocolate egg hunts happening again and the Valentine's dance. Um, just to name a few, we ran that this year for the first time since COVID had hit. Um, we also have open gym basketball three days a week um, and many groups renting the facility for basketball, indoor soccer, ping pong, birthday parties, and many other activities. We even have a group that rents it for badminton, which is kind of cool. Um, the hard part is right now is, you know, with the size of our building, we're actually turning a lot of groups away because we only have one space to to really rent. Um, key issues, we also take care of many facilities under the recreation department. We have both indoor and outdoor facilities we care for all around the city, um, starting with the recreation center, uh, Dog River, the recreation fields, stadium, tennis courts, skateboard park, outdoor basketball courts, the pool facility, picnic, um, picnic uh, pavilion, uh, picnic area over the bridge. And now we've added 203 Country Club Road, which has both indoor and outdoor um, uh, opportunities for the public, as well as, as maintenance challenges. Uh, we maintain many athletic fields, which is another challenge a lot of people don't think of. We, athletic fields are much higher maintenance level than, than just um, grass areas. Um, we also oversee the maintenance of our aging um, facilities that require preventative maintenance uh, to get the maximum use and keep the future costs down. Zach was talking a little bit about the expand, the frost uh, expand theory with roads. We also have the same issue with tennis courts. So we have to get the tennis courts down at the rec field. We've had to do some maintenance throughout the years to try to keep those from going by the wayside like the high school ones had gone through and then they had to replace them so we end up bringing somebody in to fill cracks and and patch those uh, the recreation department is proud of the facilities we have to offer the community and always working to improve our facilities whenever possible in a cost effective process um, that's all right but uh, we do cover a lot of ground. I mean, from our recreation center, which is long overdue to <laughs> be replaced. Um, hopefully we'll see a community center before I retire. I've been here for longer than I can remember. And <laughs> I, don't, I like to see it built before I go. But, um, you know, it, it's an opportunity that, you know, I believe will grow with the community. And if, if it happens, it's going to be a really awesome, awesome thing. So it's the one thing we don't have. We have a lot of outdoor space, but not enough indoor space. So I've, I've got two questions, Arnie, Arnie, which I don't necessarily expect you to have answers to to them tonight. But one is, and this came up at, at one of the candidate or candidate forums, if uh, if the current recreation building is so bad, should we really be letting people play in it? 
is it is it it's is it not, safe and good enough for people to play in the building itself is safe structurally mm -hmm. um it has the ada issues that are are the primary challenge and one of the you know one of the things we've done like with our special events is we've for our youth basketball program which we when we have games and stuff we've actually have those in the schools or in another ada accessible facility mm -hmm. so it makes it very difficult for you know planning events and stuff because we want to make sure people can get into the building and participate um but it but it is the space is um uh, uh i don't want to say it, it's very limited to what we can do you know we can't use all floors um so it's pretty much a gymnasium that's used for birthday parties or different other activities. And a lot of a lot of uh, basketball practices for AAU, as well as uh, indoor soccer, really populated come this time of year. It's booked until like nine o'clock or so a lot of nights. But people shouldn't be worried about uh, sending their kids to play there and wondering if they're going to be safe. Uh, no. Okay. No. I'd send my own kids. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other question is and this goes back to the first question that anyone asked me when i was on the council five years ago and it had to do with pickleball um and so you mentioned the tennis courts and so i'm yep. curious about the allocation of court space between uh pickleball and tennis i'm actually and where glad you we... brought that up because uh i actually have pickleball courts lined on all the tennis courts uh -huh. even the high school um it's kind of funny how we got them on the high school initially because I started with them down at the rec field and I told this company that don't put them on until I get final approval. <laughs> I was on vacation and they showed up and put on two sets of cords. Um, <laughs> so we finished them the next year, just put them all on. But realistically, the, the pickleball um, and the high school, you know, actually have some phys ed classes i believe now that actually do pickleball mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a very fast growing sport and we've actually been on the tail end of it it's been popular in a lot of other areas way sooner than here but we probably have over i think 147 pickleball players that are on a list that come through and use our gym we have like eight or nine uh set up times for pickleball during the week that people come in and play and they get punch cards and they come in, get the card punched and, but it's very popular and it brings in a lot of, a lot of people. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions, Barney? Um, I just want to thank you for everything you are doing for our community. Uh, the first year I moved here, I wasn't working and I was at home pretty bored. So I attended lots of classes. Uh, at the recreation center, like I took Spanish class, digital photography, movies and discussion, tango course, so like dancing. So I really appreciate all your uh, staff was very helpful, very, you know, uh, supportive because I was new. I didn't know of most of the things. So this is the first time I think I'm seeing you in person. So I just want to thank you all the things and your staff, all the things you are doing for our community. You're welcome. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, pinch hitting for Alec Ellsworth is Kelly Murphy. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. I know I don't look like Alec, and I might not be able to answer all the questions, but um, I certainly will get them back to you if you do have additional questions. But I'm going to um, sit in and go over um, Alec's presentation for tonight. Um, so here uh, is the org chart for parks for staff to AmeriCorps. Alec is the director. Uh, there's the park supervisor, Layla, the crew leader, Kara, and then the city arborist, Adam. And then we've got two AmeriCorps members, Josie and Merrick. Uh, they do a ton. I had the pleasure of being able to go visit the parks and I think I would like my office to be up there. So don't tell Bill, um, <laughs> but uh, really a, a really nice operation. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and so just, uh, this is a reference to some of the advisory board bodies that were referenced earlier um, in Bill's presentation and you know, some of the roles and responsibilities they have for the parks and trees. Um, get the Parks Commission, um, Conservation Commission, and then the Tree Board. 
Um, and then moving on to just key challenges for you know each of the two divisions and parks um, funding programs um, is really a, a key issue for them. Um, the Montpelier Youth Conservation Corps is really popular and they've done a ton of good work. Um, so that's an item that um, they're you know getting grants and fundraising for economic development for outdoor recreation is another thing um, that they've really been able to bring along. Um, we have had some land acqu acquisitions recently that will really help with this effort. Um, and then uh, planning that all is the green print and then um, the Feast Farm is another program. So they do a ton in that realm. And then um, on the tree side, um, a big issue is the emerald ash borer. Um, and so we're starting to see that really kind of take hold. And so Alec has identified here some of the items, um, over 700 ash trees in the public right away to be removed in the next couple of years. Um, and so there's a huge project added to top of the baseline of the tree work and then um, just making sure that there are staff with skills and um, are up to task with the equipment and all that. So that's um, parks and trees in a nutshell, real fast, like, um, so you can kind of like <laughs> skate by and fulfill the requirement. But if uh, you have questions um, and uh, would like um, any time with Alec, I'm sure he'd be really happy to have you come visit him. Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. You're welcome. Thanks. And our the last leg of the three-legged stool of community services, which is Rec Parks and Senior Center. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Lipton. I'm the director of the Montpelier Senior Activity Center. Um, Yes, we do often go last. I don't know why, but <laughs> we have lots going on. Um, our staff right now, we have, um, this wasn't really mentioned, but we're part of the community services department, and we actually share three staff across those three divisions, parks, rec, and MSAC. So we have um, Norma is our administrative assistant. She does a lot of our, all of our admin, but also supports parks and rec. Um, Matt Wilson is our communications and development coordinator. He also sits on all three divisions doing a ton of work to get our communications out there and help with all the fundraising that we do. And then we have, um, we also work with Tom who works with the rec. So, you know, there's a lot of cross pollination. And then we have our feast program. We have a full-time feast program manager, um, Poa or Eli Mutino. Our kitchen manager chef is Shalanda James. She's cranking out amazing meals over there. And then we have a part-time, um, right now one part-time uh, kitchen assistant who's helping to make sure that we're getting those meals out. We are hoping later this year to either have that position become full-time or have a second part-time person. So that's kind of, oh, and then we do have an advisory council. Um, we're about eight members right now. So we're actually looking to um, elect some more. It's not an advisory board. It's different than the other um, divisions, but it is a, a member elected council. Uh, members of the senior center elect the council every year. So we, we have a lot going on. Um, we serve the older adults in our community. Everyone 50 plus is welcome at the senior center. We have a lot of intergenerational activities though. So we have a lot more than just older adults happening at the senior center. Um, but we are really focused on being able to provide the incredibly diverse programming that allows our older adult community to really thrive while they age at home. So we have 50 plus classes that are happening throughout every semester, which has grown back from the pandemic. We had about 20 during the pandemic. Before that, we had 75 classes at a time, which makes my head want to explode, but um, <laughs> we're about 50 classes and those are ranging from health and wellness classes like yoga, tai chi, bone builders, all kinds of dance classes. You mentioned tango. We have a tango class coming up soon. Um, we have so many different sort of body movement classes. And then we also have a lot of um, arts classes, humanities classes, and many other sort of engaging events that are happening, a lot of games going on. We've got over 15 different drop-in groups that are happening throughout the week, every week. We host the um, UVM Ollie Lecture Series. We had, I think, 70 people I talked to today who are there to see a really wonderful presentation um, and many other programs and events happening. We're doing a big healthcare fair later in May that I'll be excited to share more with you about that. Um, and then our FEAST program is really as I mentioned, it's a really vital program. We have over 1,500 older adults in our community. We're only serving about 100 with our senior meals pr program. 
but those folks and probably more that we're not serving yet really need those meals. And the fact that the city of Montpelier runs a senior center that has a Meals on Wheels program is pretty amazing. I really want you to understand that. It is a very rare um, setup. It's not very often that a city runs a senior center or that a city runs and, and or that a city runs a meals program. And so with the parks division running a farm that grows produce for us, we actually have a full root to fork system, which is really unique. So the one challenge there, really the biggest challenge is that the feast program is not funded or supported by the city. Our budget in total is only about 25% funded by the city. And so we work our tuchuses off to fundraise uh, to make sure that we have the funding we need to run our feast senior meals program and everything else that we do. So uh, I'm facing two grant deadlines, so I won't keep you too much longer, but um, <laughs> we've got a lot going on and this is the March for Meals month and we've got a really exciting event happening on Saturday, March 18th, but I would love to see you there at, we've got um, a silent auction that will be emceed by drag queen Emoji Nightmare. It's gonna be really fun, lots of music and other things going on. But really, I just really want you to know that this service that the city provides to our older adult community, thank you. <laughs> really important, really important. So do you have any questions? Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. So any any general questions about city operations or anything like that? They all seem very bored. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to express my appreciation to to all of that team. They're a joy to work with and as you can see, are very uh, passionate about their work and bring creativity and, and do a lot of things to it. We're very fortunate to have have them. And I'd like to I want to thank them. We have never done this like this before, uh, this sort of lightning round and so they actually designed, they, we together designed this whole program start to finish. We had two separate team meetings about what do we want to tell the city council, what should be included, what information. So even the part that I did by myself was all, you know, outlined by them. And then, even you know, the, the presentations were like, all right, how, how do we do this? What do we, you know, so it's like, what do you want to tell the city council? Oh, okay. Who are you? What, what's your organizational chart? What do you want to tell the city council and what are your biggest challenges? That's it. That's what, that's what you get your time. And I think they did a pretty good job. So I, I appreciate that and uh, thank them. So it's, I think a lot of this you won't deal with until maybe budget time, but it's good to know that that's what's going on when. Just a hint, they should follow up all your key issues, repeat them, repeat them, repeat them. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Um. So, so great. So I'll just, Jim, I thought this was great. Bill, having okay. such even a right, brief presentation from yeah. every uh, every of the one of the departments, and around the time that I got on the council, we arranged for tours for new council members. For right. am I anticipating what you're about to that say? That was just where I was going next. So, so we certainly can arrange tours for people that would like to do that, and especially now that we're post camp uh, pandemic. Uh, the, you know, the police, the fire chief already mentioned. Uh, go into the fire department, staying, stay overnight if you want. The police chief, I know they will do ride-alongs with police people. We've done group tours. The water plant and the sewer plant are really uh, fascinating. The BW garage, you, know, you just get a better handle of what's what's going in there. The rec facilities, I know some of you, like me, if had kids grow up here, you know a lot of these facilities. Other people, this is all brand new to. So, um, you know, we can, if you'd like to us to arrange something for all of you together, we can do that if you'd like to do that. But please, they love visitors. Their staff loves visitors. Uh, they're, they're the people that work in these facilities are as enthusiastic about their work as, as these folks are about leading their department. So um, see, hear, touch, feel, you know, go, go do that. And we will help make, if you want to do it, you know, you don't have to do it on your own. We'll help arrange it at any time. You say you want to see something. So. Uh, you'll you'll be glad you did. I, I you know I do it often because I go sometimes. With, I don't always go with the council, but sometimes I do. And you know I've heard these, and I always learn something new, and it's just so refreshing to. So please take advantage of that. This is this will be the shortest part of the project of the presentation, but for projects, you know, you for some of you, your your time on the council started today or yesterday or in January. 
but projects roll along for for years and this is a list of kind of what's on the board right now in various stages of uh you know happening and the ones that are highlighted uh specifically highlighted because those are the projects that are likely to come to the city council for more either decisions or guidance of those kinds of things some of the others are just things that you know are going to happen the grout road bridge for example is out, out to bid that's I, you, unless there's a problem you probably won't hear about it again except when it's done we'll tell you it's done um some of the drainage projects those kinds of things but public restroom uh it's been an issue we've been facing for a couple of years as an active committee uh, at some point there's going to be a recommendation for what to do with that and how to fund it and what it looks like you're going to have to consider that in uh either the next meeting or the one after we're going to be uh getting a recommend or hearing a report from the consultant we retained to sort of recommend facilities and, and uh programs for home you know folks experiencing homeless uh so that's the decisions we'll have to make uh you heard arnie talk about the Barry street rec center and while it's not unsafe for people to participate you know play in it that is filled with asbestos so any re renovation that it has then becomes costly has terrible hvac system it's not accessible so what are we going to do with that if we do build a new facility at country club road or somewhere else then what's going to happen with this building that becomes the next question what are we going to do with that do we tear it down do we reuse it what knowing its cost so those are that's a big decision that's going to fall for it 1216 main street is the open piece of land right now where uh, m m beverage used to be the city council made a decision to sell that with um uh with an emphasis on housing perhaps retail or something on the first floor uh that subdivision is being completed but at some point we will engage with that again so um that will be revisited country club road of course is a huge project um probably easily the biggest one we have going in terms of policy you'll be very engaged in that the public will be very engaged in that east state street um that is one last piece that will come to you this is just going to reset right yes um and that is the final street layout so we we did some street type so you know where is there a bike lane is there you know do we need to put so there the you won't be involved in the design of the water lines and sewer lines and storm drains and everything underneath but you will have final say as far as uh what the final layout of the surface looks like so that is a decision you'll have to make mike already referenced the city plan that's the artist formerly known as the master plan and uh that is been in works for a couple of years it's coming to the planning commission so that is uh depending on how you know how much in detail that you want to get into that that could be you know one meeting or six months worth of meetings um so uh that might be one that as the planning commission starts engaging with that you might want to follow their meeting so you can hear a lot of the presentation that's coming that's that's you know when we talk about how to spend your hundred hours part of that is going to be the city plan stormwater utility you'll be getting an update on that pretty soon we are in again you still have a final say on this hasn't been determined but the plan is to create a stormwater utility to deal with all of these outflows and cleaning and make sure we have clean water and, and regular funding and then what to do about confluence park do we continue the project do we not do we you know at this point the current status the city council said no more city money going into it you get 18 months to come back and show us if you can support the rest but obviously, uh, you know, that's subject to change. So I just mentioned those because those are things that will be on your plate. Uh, even if you didn't pick for them to be on your plate, this group, uh, they're, they'll be there. And then the others are just, it's good to know the stuff that's going on. So that's it. Any questions about projects? Uh, Bill, did you say anything about homelessness facility or? Did I miss it? Yeah, so, shelter or? Yeah, so we're going to be getting a report from a consultant that the homelessness task force requested and the city set aside some ARPA money for this issue, 445,000. So the, the study's coming from that. So it'll be about 400,000 left. And they have been in, you know, so I think they're going to come to us. And they've, they've got to go through, they have not presented their report to the homelessness task force yet. So I think they will discuss that there and then when it's complete then uh, they will come to the city council and it will include recommendations i you know i think they may be eyeing the rec center as a you know potential place for some sort of facility but uh i think they also have an idea of what kind of programming would be important and i so I, i've only i haven't heard a final report yet but 
that we'll let the experts do that. But that is that will be coming up probably next meeting or the meeting after. That's really prime for uh, almost ready for for um, prime time. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, project questions. Any questions about anything that we didn't cover? Because there are stuff, believe it or not, there is stuff we didn't cover. So, are there any parties for city council? Are we? Yeah. Hello, Christmas party. Second and fourth Wednesday of every month, we get together. Well, Ellen, I can tell you that uh, that last year it wasn't fully attended, but we did organize an uh, outing to a ball game one night, and uh, and there were a few members of the council at at that, and I would be interested in doing that again. And the council often marches in the uh, July third parade. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but you know we could create a party committee. It sounds like we have a chair. <laughs> I would love to do that. <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll have to tango. Okay. So I just want to leave you with one thing. This is from Teddy Roosevelt, nineteen ten, and so I forgive the sexist language, um, but if this is a very famous quote: "Is is the man in the arena." And I'm going to read it to you, even though I know you can all read. Uh, but this is what you've all signed up for, essentially. It says, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out the, how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena. That's you. Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never know victory or defeat. You're going to hear a lot of criticism. You're going to get a lot of feedback. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to get a lot of comment. And um, you're the ones doing the work. So my hat's off to all of you for, for volunteering to do this and putting up with us and long meetings and nights away from home. Um, so I'll leave you with that. And thanks for serving. And that's all we have for this. Thanks, Bill. This is a great presentation. We're up to item 16, other business, and we do not have any other business. Next, we're up to council reports. Did I just kick click myself off uh, Zoom? No, I didn't. Good. Um, next, we're up to council reports. We'll start with Councillor Hurl this time. Great. Um my only thing, just wanted to thank the voters for um, re-electing me to another term. Um, I mean, just, I think tonight really echoed the really, I think, critical issues the city's facing, really important projects in the works that I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to continue um, trying to make progress on and stumbling along the way, but doing our best to try to um, leave the community better than we found it. So just thanks to all the voters and thanks to all the candidates who ran and congratulations to the new members of council. Welcome. I just want to say the same thing. So uh, thank you, Lauren. You did a great uh, uh, talk. So I will just say thank you. All the people in district two uh, vote for me and I will represent their ideas here uh, at the city council. And I also wanna propose, since we heard lots of things about comedies, everything, and I know that we have so many volunteers, community volunteers doing great job uh, to keep our community uh, very supportive and welcoming and engaging. So uh, December 5th is the World Volunteer Day. 
So it will be great if city can have some kind of celebration to appreciate all our uh, community volunteers. Thank you. Sounds like, thanks. So thank you, I agree with everything Lauren and Palin said. And the process was really interesting to just go through. And for me, it, it didn't until this afternoon because my election was so tight with only a 22 vote margin. But uh, when Tom called, but I'd like to thank Orca for the efforts to help bring the election process out to the community and the Rotary Club and the Bridge and the Times Argus all played a key role and one of our only opportunities to really give voters a chance to see us and hear us and get a sense of who we were. So thank you. And thanks tonight to Bill and to the whole uh, team for all your work to give us a sense of the scale and the scope of this operation and what we're we're working with. So uh, thank you for that. Next up, uh, Councillor Brown. Yeah, thanks. I just want to welcome all of the new folks, Tim and Sal. I'm so sorry I'm not there to say welcome in person, but I'll see you next time. And congratulations on your election and welcome back to Palin and Lauren. And, um, and congratulations to you, Jack. I'm really pleased that we're all we're all together and ready to get to work. And I just want to thank everybody who ran um, I know I'm kind of echoing what other folks have said, but I do think it's it's just so important. And it, um, you know, to me, it's a sign of a healthy democracy when we have lots of people running for office. And so I'm so grateful to everybody who ran and everyone who voted. And that is all I have for tonight. Thanks. Thanks. And Sal, sorry, I skipped over you. I should have called you first, but you're up. Yeah, no, th uh, thanks, Jack. Um, well, I, I really want to thank Bill and the, and the city staff. You know, when I got the, what, 167 page packet, I said, oh, this is something that, you know, they do every year um, orientation, but it, it obviously <laughs> it wasn't. It's something you did. Um, I feel like you did it, you know, for people like me who are new to this. And I greatly appreciate it, it was very helpful. Um, it's nice to put a face to a name and to know who the, who the people are, uh, you know, behind the, the work that's being done. Um, and I'm just, um, I'm just delighted to be working with this group. Uh, you're, you're all, uh, you know, dedicated public servants. And um, I hope I can live up to the expectations of, uh, of my supporters. So thank you. Thanks, Sal. Donna. I apologize. I, I'm having a little bit of an echo here because my iPad won't go mute. It'll just go low. Uh, and, uh, I would like to congratulate everyone who won, but also congratulate everybody who ran, because to run is to step up to the plate and really appreciate that. But I also want to thank the staff and all the volunteers that made the election possible. It takes a lot of hours to put on an election. And I think we need some education courses, though, John. I think it's really important people understand the labor that ride-ins cause, whether it's a Mickey Mouse ride-in or a serious ride-in, it takes a lot of staff time to deal with those ballots. But there's other things about how to mark the ballot, how to read it. We had so many long lines because the ballots weren't done right. So I feel we really need some workshops on that. Um, but thank you, John, you got through it. <laughs> Machines are not working. You did very well, as did all the staff and volunteers. And just one heads up about the Stormwater Committee. You will be getting a report in the next couple of months. We have been working on the rates, and we're dealing with two issues. What's the most fair and equitable, but what's the most easy to implement? And there's a really conflicting measurements. So uh, you'll be hearing what we settled on as months progress. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Mayor's report. I uh, I said a few words at the beginning. I don't think I have any anything to add to that. So I'll move it along to the city clerk. Um, other than reminding people that uh, water bills are coming up too, um, I just you know bear with me. I'm sleep deprived, but um, I'm just really struck again. A big part of of, of every election we have is you know, I recruit and coordinate anywhere from 40 to 60 volunteers. 
and just being struck again by how critical, not only how critical all those folks are, how good natured they always are, and how just really ready to help folks in this town are when it's it's time to put on an election. It's really striking. And I talk to people, you know, in similar positions in other towns and, you know, nobody's heard of anything like this. So it's, it's really great. And it was a great experience. And thank you all who helped out uh, very much. City manager's report. Well, I've got a lot of to talk about. Um, great. For us here. I just like to, again, I'll echo what everybody said about uh, thanks to all the folks who ran and congrats to the winners. I'm really looking forward to working with all of you this year uh, now that you all know everything. And, uh, but no, we, you know, we talked a little bit with the last group about um, the, the group's ability to work function as a high functioning group. And I think this group will continue that way, just knowing the individuals that have joined us. Uh, we respect one another and move forward and that that's how we'll get stuff done uh, i will say um and i will try to say this as kindly as i can but with regard to an earlier comment i had absolutely nothing to do with the dissolution of cvpsa those was a decision that was made by them uh no influence on that i was never asked about it i was never i don't think i ever even attended a meeting of them ever in their entire time so i do take exception to that uh, I do believe that the police review committee uh, reviewed lots of issues and uh, uh, in specific incidents weren't part of their charge. And um, and it may be that uh, people are moving their cars from night to night, but I have observed plowed roads and there is not snow on the roads and there has been snow removed. So it seems clear to me that plowing is occurring. So with that, that's done. Okay, yes, Donna. Sorry, I did forget the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority disillusionment plan that passed. Dissolution. Dissolution. What is the word? Dissolution. Dissolution. Okay, thank you. I do that with words all the time. I need everybody listening and correcting me. Um, that was a document that was legally prepared, and within it, it sets very clear steps to make sure all of our expenditures, all our obligations are covered, and that indeed, the board ceases to exist at the time that the vote was confirmed in both Barry and Montpelier that that passed. And within that plan, it also appoints the chair, who is me, to lead the lawsuit. Other than the lawsuit, everything else is handled. And so we have just this little bit left of the lawsuit. So we have uh, a person appointed to cover that, but everything else around, around its business is covered in that plan. Thanks, Donna. Okay, having completed our business, no further business, uh, we will be uh, adjourned at 941. Thank you all.